So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this tutorial on psychology informed recommender systems. Sorry, that's the first slide. Um, yeah, thanks for showing up here uh, at the ACM web conference and to our tutorial. So uh, who are we? Basically, it's Professor Elizabeth Lex who's gonna hold the tutorial, give the tutorial jointly with me. So Elizabeth is a professor at the Graz University of Technology uh, and head of the recommender systems and social computing lab. Yeah, basically interested in recommender systems, user modeling, network analysis, and a lot of more topics. And I had the pleasure to collaborate with her for quite a while now, among others in this personality informed recommender systems. So I'm a professor, Markus Schädel, professor at JKU at Johannes Kepler University in Linz, also in Austria, uh, at the Institute of Computational Perception, where I lead the Multimedia Mining and Search Group, and I'm also head of the Human Centered AI Group at the Linz Institute of Technology. And we're very happy that you are interested in today's tutorial on psychology and from the recommender systems. So before we start, we'd like to point you to this article because most of the material uh, that we'll cover in this tutorial today is based on a well, pretty long article, I would say, that we published in the Foundations in Trans and Information Retrieval Journal, so more than 100 pages. So if you want to dig deeper into any of those topics, we strongly recommend you to consider uh, this article, which should be freely available at least from our personal web pages uh, that you can also find in the slides. Yeah. And also here is the link to the preprint. <clears throat> and not surprisingly, the paper is also called Psychology Informed Recommender Systems. So what can you expect from today's tutorial? Uh, tutorial is organized in three parts. So first, we'll give you a very short introduction to what we mean by Psychology Informed Recommender Systems. And in the main part, in the second part, we will detail the different kind of categories of such PIRS, as we like to call them. Uh, in particular, we'll cover recommender systems that are based on cognition models. So this will be uh, taught by Elizabeth. And I will then proceed with uh, digging a little bit deeper into personality aware recommender systems and then also affect aware, so basically mood and emotion aware recommender systems. And finally, we'll conclude with a well, short summary and let you know what are still the most important open research directions within uh, this topic of personality informed recommender systems. And there are still plenty, as you will see, since this is a quite young uh, research endeavor. <clears throat> Sorry. So to be all on the same page, we don't know, of course, exactly which background uh, you have. We would like to very, very briefly uh, summarize the main flavors of recommender systems. So probably everyone knows collaborative filtering, which is basically based on the assumptions that uh, users who, uh, yeah, who had similar interests in the past will also like similar items in the futures in the future. So uh, similarity between users are typically uh, computed. And uh, yeah, those items consumed by similar users are recommended to the target user. Then we have content based filtering, where the focus is on describing items through some uh, content characteristics can be well, it's very often genre or some other tags or meta information that is assigned to well, the items like movies or music, for instance. And then the goal is, or the idea is to recommend to the target user items that are most similar to the content they already uh, rated or consumed. So for instance, movies from the same genre, songs from the same genre. Then we have context aware recommender systems. As the name suggests, they consider, in addition to the interactions between users and items, the context or the situation at which uh, the user consumed the item. So typical examples are weather conditions or locations. And then finally, we have hybrid recommender systems that basically we, for the sake of simplicity, 
interpret as any combination of at least two of the above mentioned one. Oh, I'm just realizing you don't see me. I'm very sorry for that. So <laughs> here I am. Um, yeah, let me just switch the camera. So basically where we want to position or where we position the personality in from recommender systems is somewhere between those because personality can be considered as a context aware factor, of course, of the user, sometimes even of the item, as we'll see in the next uh, three hours approximately. So now it's time for Elizabeth to take over while I'm adjusting the camera, switching to the right one. So <laughs> please take over, Liz. Hi, great. So first of all, can you all hear me? So the, the famous questions that everybody has. I should have asked whether you can yeah. see me. <laughs> I hope so. So, Marcus, you can hear me. So, I hope everybody can hear me. I can, yeah. Um, let me just so, share the screen. So does it work now? No. No, not in full screen. Okay. Not in full. But you see it, or? I see it, but not so in full screen. Ah, yeah. Ah, okay. No, I see it. Okay. Okay, now I can see it, yeah, so, okay, great. <clears throat> Fantastic, so first of all, thank you also from my side for maintaining the tutorial. And um, since we're in this virtual format, it would be great if we could make an effort to <laughs> have some interaction as well. So it would be great. So on the first, first of all, so please, if you have any questions, write them in the chat or you can also unmute yourself. Um, we try to follow the chat as, as much as possible, of mm -hmm. course. And it would also be great to learn something about your backgrounds and um, your motivation of attending the tutorial, maybe also your previous experiences with combining psychological findings with either a recommender systems research, but also maybe an information retriever research on a larger scale. So if you care, it would also be great to put some of the experiences that you had in the chat as well and we can then all learn from each other. Um, I would like now to to explain to you or to show you <coughs> our motivation basically so why we think these two completely different disciplines of psychology and uh, recommender systems research, computer science research actually go very well together especially in the field of recommender systems. Um, if we go back to the beginnings, to the early start of the recommender systems research, um, basically, so the first systems that were designed were very much motivated by observations that psychologists made or cognitive scientists made on how humans make their decisions and how humans come to conclusions when it comes to, for instance, finding out which kind of TV show to watch or what kind of book to read. And in the end, so, I mean, I think we know this maybe from our, from our own experiences. Humans, we as humans, we tend to base many of our decisions on the recommendations that other people who are similar to us, who are, who are our peers, who are in our social circles, give us. And this is exactly what the early work in recommender systems tried to mimic this human decision-making behavior. And there they heavily uh, employed findings or exploited findings from psychology on um, how emotions shape our preferences and decisions, how our attention spans are, are somehow limited, how we come, how we exploit, for instance, heuristics, cognitive heuristics in order to, to make fast decisions. Then what influences whether users are satisfied with a system how mood uh, plays on, into preferences and how also like technology is used to, to regulate mood. And we will see some examples here also in the presentation of Marcus. And I mean, there's a, a whole body of work on human decision-making in psychology where we can um, exploit findings for recommender systems design. What is great now is, so we have this theory, this large body of theory from psychology and in the community of recommender systems, of course, we, not, we have now vast amounts of behavior data. So we can observe what kind of items users choose or not choose. 
And now we can combine these data-driven machine learning based approaches from recommender systems research with the psychological models on the one hand to understand if the psychological models are indeed, um, let's say correct or indeed verifiable. And on the other hand, to improve the recommendation process by combining findings from psychology with computer science. And what's also interesting, maybe, so the early work, the early starts in the community of recommender systems was really also published in cognitive science journals. So, so the first, the agreed upon first recommender system, the Grundy system was employing stereotypes, so a psychological concept, a cognitive heuristic that we use to come to decisions faster. And um, they designed a, a more or less a recommendation system for a TV guide. And the whole thing was published not in a computer science venue, but in a cognitive science journal. And so in the, so in the beginnings of this community, so the, 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 the two strands were really intertwined. But now, of course, in the recommender systems field, so we have now through the advances, advances in deep learning, um, many, many uh, innovations in terms of new algorithms, uh, exploiting even more data, making sense of even more data. But now uh, we think that it makes sense to go back a little bit and to go back into incorporating psychological findings in order to have transparency in the process and in order to really understand what's going on with the user. Um, now we would like, um, so in this, in this survey article that was published in the Foundations and Trends in Information Retrieval, article that Marcus has mentioned. So we um, skimmed or we, we um, analyzed a large amount of papers that have employed psychological models in the design of recommendation algorithms. And we developed a taxonomy in order to find some categories or groups of, of papers that I would like to present to you now. <clears throat> We di distinguished the large body of work in, psychological, in, in psychology informed recommender systems into works that employ cognitive models in the, in the design of algorithms. And this is what we termed then cognition inspired recommender systems. So those are systems that draw heavily from findings in cognitive science. Then another large bulk of work in the field is using findings from personality research, we term, or the term is here, it's a commonly agreed upon term, I would say, personality aware recommender systems. So those are systems that incorporate um, insights from personality traits, of users' personality traits, for instance, to, to further personalize recommendations. And the third category in this taxonomy is effect aware recommender systems. So those are systems that in factor in the influence of emotion and mood into the design of algorithm. And this, this is especially important if you think about uh, the entertainment domain. So in terms of music recommender systems, of course, our emotions are largely influencing our preference in what kind of music we would like to listen uh, at a given point in time. And from these three categories now in this tutorial, we would like to give you a background for, e for each of the category in this taxonomy. And we will show you um, relevant, uh, related works that have done, have made empirical findings here. And now I would like to, to start with cognition inspired recommender systems as a first part in this taxonomy of psychological, psychology informed recommender systems. Um, for this field, because I don't know um, how experienced uh, the people in the crowd are with, with the concepts of cognitive science. So some might have a lot of knowledge, other, so, so bear with me while other, for others it's, it's rather new. So I'll give a short introduction what it is. What are the main research questions cognitive scientists investigate themselves in? And then I will show you examples where cognition, cognitive models has been used to design or evaluate recommender systems. And here in this presentation, we will discuss uh, stereotypes as a simple cognitive model to 
to design algorithms, <coughs> then we will talk a lot about memory, the cognitive process memory, because this the, co the way um, our memory works, at least how psychologists describe how our memory works, is very much related to findings or to our approach in designing retriever systems, for instance. Then we will talk a bit about case-based reasoning and then attention. Um, as an important cognitive process that shapes what kind of items we devote our focus to. Um, in the paper, um, we also review works on competence. Um, competence is also a concept that is heavily studied in cogni cognition, but in cognitive science, mostly in the context of learning systems, of e-learning, and we provide some some review in the paper, but I will not go into detail in this presentation for now. So what are now, what is now cognition and how do cognition inspired recommender systems employ findings from cognitive science? Cognition is basically like a, a huge topic, a huge research field and it is defined as the accumulation of knowledge that humans gain from learning and experience. So from interacting with our environment, learning from these interactions and the experiences that we gain and store, for instance, in our memory. Um, cognition is also the ability that we can process information based on perception. So based on our senses, based on seeing, based on feeling, based on, on reading something and so forth. Cognition is a topic that is, like I said, really broad. It's studied not only in, in cognitive science, but predominantly, of course, in cognitive science. It's studied heavily in, in the fields of psychology, but also in sociology, because the way, for instance, we process information and perceive information, of course, influences our actions in a social setting. But also in computer science, cognition is studied heavily. If you're thinking about, I don't know, I don't know vision, computer vision systems and neurology and so forth. So it's a topic that is really like cross disciplinary, I would say. And of course, we can also study it in the context of recommender systems. Here in this, maybe in this small <laughs> figure here, in this stylized figure, you can see like fundamental cognitive processes. So memory is a really fundamental process that we all need in order to interact with our physical and social environment. Attention is a fundamental process because of course our brain is limited in some sense and we have to filter all the, all the information that we perceive. Then decision making is fundamental in, in cognition. Um, problem solving and reasoning is of course fundamental in cognition. So everything that we need to, to, to process information. And perception, so like I said, so with these five senses and all the information that comes through our sensory registers. Pattern recognition is a fundamental cognition related process, organization of knowledge and formation of language. So it's a rich field and it's uh, quite exciting also for computer scientists to look into cognition. What now cognition inspired recommender systems do? So they incorporate models and theories of cognition. So from any of these cognitive model in order to model and understand user behavior. Because we, if you understand the principles of human decision making, we of course can develop more tailored user, user models to support human decision making, for instance. But also cognition inspired recommender systems have been used to like address shortcomings of existing algorithms like collaborative filtering has some shortcomings when it comes to like temporal aspects of user preferences. And I will show you some examples here later on. So summing up, so also the link between our cognitive science research and recommender systems is on the one hand, cognitive scientists try to understand how our cognition works, how our human mind works. They try to describe and explain these principles and also to predict 
uh, people's behavior based on the findings that they make in mostly observational and also ex empirical studies. And one example would be, so if you have memorized a name or heard a name at some point, and then maybe in the, in the somewhere in the near future, you forget the name of the person. And then a classic research question would be, what kind of cognitive process is responsible for you that you, uh, in your brain that you have forgotten the name? Would it be the cognitive process attention? Because I don't know, you did not pay so much attention or maybe the name was not that important at that point of time in time when you heard it or is it uh, related to memory issues so was it only stored for instance in your short-term memory and never in your never moved into into your long-term memory so those would be questions the way cognitive scientists answer such question is very much related to um, a computer science approach because they frequently employ what is called cognitive computational modeling so since it has the word computational in it, it means so they, they perform experiments, they collect behavioral data, of course, in not so, so, of course, the scale is different in terms of computer scientists. So we as computer scientists, we collect data on a really large scale typically. And they have a very ma mathematical approach. So they develop statistical models, probabilistic models, and then they fit these models on the behavioral data that they collected through experiments and then um, describe, for instance, a mathematical function of mental processes. And I will show you an example of such a mathematical function um, when we talk about um, the cognitive process memory and how we can employ findings from memory research for recommender systems research. And what is also great is cognitive scientists, they employ like a computational metho metaphor. So what they do, so they don't only um, perform empirical studies, but they also work heavily with simulation in order to like simulate parts of the human mind uh, via computational models. Frequently they combine this with data-driven approaches or also they like provide like programs, frameworks, um, in a specific programming language so that, that this also can be then employed uh, for doing simulation in various applications. And what this allows is, <coughs> sorry, this allows to test theories, this allows to like take this, op this observed behavioral data and then see what kind of cognitive processes they really match or fit to. Now I would like to show you now more concretely how we how cognitive models can, have been used in the field of recommender systems research. And here um, we also did another type of categorization. So <coughs> um, one category of cognition inspired recommender systems employs stereotypes, which are cognitive heuristics in the design of algorithms. Then uh, another category is using human memory models um, for recommender systems design. And this is more or less, uh, this is a huge, ch huge chunk of, of work. I would say it's a lot of work focusing on human memory models. Then I will briefly talk about um, case-based reasoning. And case-based reason reasoning are more or less a of course, a specific type of recommender systems, but this is heavily influenced by findings in cognitive science. Um, so this is why it's also considered as a psychology informed recommender systems approach. Then there's competence models. I mentioned this, so we will not discuss this here in this tutorial, but of course, psychologists observing learning trajectories, learning processes of, of learners at school or in universities also came up with, with, a model, with models on how to, how to help people reach certain competences and so forth. And then we'll talk also about attention as, an, as a way to use findings from cognition in recommender systems. If there are any questions, then please, at this point, interrupt. I think there's not so much yet, but please I'm interrupt not moderating me. the chat. Write it in the chat. Let's yeah. Let's start with the with the simplest or the, the 
it's, yeah, it's the simplest would say <laughs> the most naive cognition inspired recommendation algorithm or concept. Um, this is stereotypes. <laughs> stereotypes, of course, have a very bad reputation <laughs> because, of course, it's not, not great to base your decisions based on only stereotypes. But actually, from a psychological perspective, stereotypes is a form of cognitive heuristics that we all employ at some point in our decision making processes in order to speed up decision making or in order to like, um, yeah, ease decision making because this is more or less what psychologists tell us is our, our human mind wants to like limit the amount of energy that we take and limit the amount of time that we that we need to take when we make decisions. So what stereotypes are is, is basically a collection, a grouping of frequently curing characteristics of users. So it's like clustering the characteristics of your users in your data set according to the most frequent uh, traits, for instance. So this could be like age, this could be like some demographic, yeah, some demographic features, this could be like like interests or being like profession, like being being computer scientists versus um, or academics versus non-academics. So this would be a type of stereotype that that could be applied. But the advantage of stereotypes is that it helps reduce complexity, that it helps introduce a form of categorization in our mind. And this simplification more or less is, is helpful because it helps focus on, on only a subset of characteristics. <clears throat> The early work in recommender systems was focused on employing stereotypes for algorithm design. The first one uh, that I'd like to mention here is the so-called Grundy system, which was developed by a computer scientist, Elaine Rich, and it was already in 1979, so quite a long, long time ago. And interestingly enough, it was published in a cognitive science journal. So you could see the interdisciplinary connections quite nicely here. And the aim of this uh, early recommender system was to implement book recommendations for people. So to have yeah, so a kind of like artificial librarian where people could then get recommendations for books. And the recommendations were based on a system where people were organized into stereotypes or into categories according to these stereotypes, more or less. So how does it work? So it had basically two types of information. On the one hand, the stereotypes. So this was in the collection of traits or collection of characteristics of users. And the second type of info, input information, um, it had a collection of triggers. And these triggers were, were events that um, showed the system that a particular stereotype would apply. Um, and we can see um, in a very, very simple example here <laughs> in this figure. So um, here are some sample triggers. This is from the paper by Elaine Rich. So for instance, the stereotype would be, so this person is a non-TV person. So this, um, so the description of the stereotype, so likely this person would be highly educated and more serious and would like to have then, um, I don't know, a recommendation of a more serious, maybe an academic book or something like that. And this, the, trigger then was then associated with the stereotype scientist. And then whenever um, like this trigger of being a non-TV non person, being a serious person and was triggered, then the, the Grundy system would give you a, a more academic book recommendation or a more scientific book recommendation. Or here, this also, this hierarchy would be also another example. So in, in the second figure, so we have we have any person, then maybe we have the stereotype that's a religious person, and then we have then like subcategories of a Christian person, and could be Catholic and Protestant, and all of them were then described with characteristic words and triggers. 
of course, this is a, a huge <laughs> abstraction and of course um, could also lead to very misleading, very wrong recommendations if you think about it. But the advantage of this is it's really simplistic. The model, the underlying model is completely transparent because you have this description of the stereotypes, you have the nice description of the collection of triggers, so you would know exactly why a recommendation was triggered. And given these example, these advantages, stereotypes are very often complemented with other recommendation system approaches, especially in the case when you have no user data or no behavioral data. So it's kind of like a fallback mechanism in, in, the, in case you have a lack of data. And this is also true today. So I put here a reference of a PhD thesis from 2021. So where um, an item-based stereotype recommender <coughs> was complemented with a data-driven approach as a kind of fallback mechanism. Now, I would like to talk about a more complex topic in, in the field of cognition-inspired recommender systems, where the idea is to draw heavily from memory research. Memory is a really fundamental cognitive process um, because it suppo supports all our goal-directed interaction with our social environment and with our physical environment. And we see this so whenever somebody has a problem with their memory um, due to many reasons, then this interaction is, is disturbed a lot. So it has a central role in when we solve problems, in shaping our and helping us focus our attention, in making decisions and in perceptions. Um, Memory is actually a topic that is studied a lot in psychology. And this is why many models of memory, of course, exist. <coughs> there is actually like, yeah, I would say there are, many of these models are, are similar, but like uh, differentiate themselves in only in small, small parts. So what is common to all of these models is that memory consists of different types of memory structures. So like a sensory register where all, all the sensory input is registered um, that comes from perceiving our environment. Then there is typically a short-term memory structure where memory is stored for only like maybe 10 minutes and a long-term memory structure where we store all the information that we learn in a long-term way. So like all the facts that we learn at some point in time. Um, in comparison, so I'd say, so I put here one memory model, so the atkinson schifrin model on the slide, because this is a very frequently applied model, a very commonly agreed upon model. It was also developed quite some time ago in 1968, uh, it was published. And here you see exactly these memory structures nicely. So you have some kind of input from our environment, <coughs> like, you see something, you hear something, you read something. This is then recorded in the sensory memory and everything that is in there is, is forgotten quite, quite easily or quite quickly. But when there is something that um, comes from our, sen from our sensory inputs that um, like attracts our attention or this is important for us, then it's recorded in the short-term memory according to this Atkinson Schifrin model. And in this short-term memory, of course, information is also sh stored only in the short time for like for 10 minutes. So it can be forgotten through just over time through a decay or because it's, it's replaced by some other information. <coughs> and if this is then a piece of information that is then more important for us, for our, for our mind, then it's recorded in the long-term memory there it's typically contextualized so that we can be retrieved. So it can be stored and retrieved. Um, and here, um, of course, information can also be forgotten, but this is then a more complex process. It's not only decay, time dependent decay or displacement, but interference or retriever failure. So that means it's, it's maybe it's, it's still stored somewhere, but maybe it's contextualized uh, wrongly and 
uh, retrieve is not that easy. <coughs> so if we sum up these key functions of this cognitive process memory, so we have as a key one key function, the encoding on for information. This is where information is recorded so that the memory system can use the information. The storage, so where then information is bound to uh, in the encoding, what I forgot, it's there when the information is acquired, it's bound to contextualized data. Like most of the cases, it's temporal information or spatial context. So that later on, we can do this context guided retriever of memory. And this is what, what you have might observed as well. So when you have made a specific experience at a specific location, I don't know, vacation maybe, you and then later on, some years later, you go to the same location, this memory might come back to you because location, so the spatial context is such a strong memory cue. Then in the storage um, um, function, then the coded information is, is stored over a period of time given, so depending on what kind of, if it's long-term or short-term memory, and then there's the third key function is retrieval. So where we can recover the stored information from the memory, depending on when we need it. And since I would assume many of you are computer scientists, I think this is very much what we do as computer scientists. So we, we crawl data maybe, we then uh, like contextualize or crawl data, store all kinds of metadata. We store it somewhere in a database. <clears throat> and then when we need the information, we retrieve it. And I think this is where, doing, where you can see nicely. So like the link between cognitive science approaches on, and computer science approaches. So we use more or less the same, same concepts here when we process information. Memory has, has all sorts of very interesting effects. So one effect that has been heavily studied in the in, in information systems research, in information retrieval systems, in recommender systems research is the so-called serial positioning effect that you also might have realized yourself when you have interacted with lists of items. Um, <coughs> so when we see a list of items or when we maybe try to memorize a list of words, um, we remember typically the, the items or words at the, in the first and then the last positions much better than what, everything that comes in the, in the middle. And this is called serial positioning effect. Um, this is why, because of serial position effects and also other effects, why we tend to click, like if you have a list of recommendations. So if you want to have something that people really click on, you should put it either at the beginning of a list of recommendations or your end list of recommendations, because it's typically where people then <coughs> also uh, tend to click more frequently compared to everything that is in the middle. And this memory effect was detected by a psychologist or in the 1880s. So really, really long, long term ago. <coughs> and what he also found, so Ebbinghaus, is that memory, re memory retention declines over time. Um, so what he did is he did an, a classic, like, psychological experiment. So he tried, he himself memorized non, nonsense syllables and then repeatedly tested his memorization in order to quantify the rate of forgetting. And what he found is that memory retention yeah, follows this time dependent decay <coughs> in the form of like a, an exponential function. Um, so this is the, this is the equation. So the more time has elapsed, the more, the higher the probability that you forget something. So something that is very recent, if you have you seen very recently, um, has a higher chance of being memorized. So why am I showing this to you? Because this 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 curve, so this Ebbinghaus curve from the eight from 1885, can actually be used quite nicely to um, deal with shortcomings of classic recommendation algorithms. 
So <laughs> collaborative filtering, which is one of the, yeah, I think it's the, the most famous <laughs> recommendation algorithm. Marcus nice outlined this so nicely in the beginning when he was talking about the main flavors of Rexis. Um, so it's really a great algorithm. However, um, it does not account for user, for user interest changes. So in a rating-based collaborative filtering algorithm, you just um, predict or you just like find similar users based on similar ratings and you do not care for when the user has provided the ratings. So the time information about the ratings is completely ignored. But of course, this is a, this is a shortcoming because if I have rated maybe a movie 10 years ago, this movie might not be that relevant for my current interests anymore. Um, so, <coughs> because my interests have changed over the past 10 years. And color, collaborative filtering does not account for this kind of, kind of fact. So what now the idea of this paper by, by Ren et al, which was published in 2015, was to model the changes in user interests as a form of forgetting information. And they had the idea to exploit this Ebbinghaus curve from the 18, <laughs> from 1885 to do exactly that. Because the advantage of this Ebbinghaus curve is really, so it's a simple mathematical formalism. It's just an exponential function. So what they did then is they created like a time-based <coughs> exponential decay weight based on when, based of the time when the rating was produced. Um, and this weight was then like just added as another term in the in the equation where the similarity between item was computed and um, when the rating prediction was done. So when a rating was produced long longer ago, it gets a, a less weight. So the weight is lower. So it has less influence in the, in the computation of the similarity between items and in the prediction of, of the ratings. And with this rather simple psychologically informed um, extension of, of a classic rating-based collaborative filtering, they could <coughs> reduce the error in the prediction by a large amount. So they could provide more accurate recommendations by incorporating this Ebbinghaus curve function in their model. I think this is a great way of like combining a data-driven machine learning based approach with an extension of a, of a mathematical, of a concept from mathematical psychology to improve prediction quality. Um, what we have now seen, so these cognitive processes, and, and there are so many of them, uh, memory, attention, whatever. <clears throat> and this is why um, these fundamentals of human cognition are often organized in so-called cognitive architectures in order to have like a more unified theory of the human mind where you have then like various aspects of various cognitive processes together all together in a cognitive architecture. <coughs> a cognitive architecture is more or less like a, like, in, like a programming language or a concept where we can do uh, great empirical work because it consists of model, modules to access and for instance, alter memories and to access representation. And typically for all of these cognitive architectures that have been proposed, programmatic implementations are already available, um, which is great, of course, for experimentation. Um, in terms of cognitive architectures, there are many of them. Like I see, you can see this here. So from this plot, so there are many, many, many cognitive architectures. <coughs> Not all of them. So, so also some of them are quite similar. Some of them cover specific aspects of human cognition. And what I would like to show you is this cognitive architecture, <coughs> ACT R, Adaptive Control of Thought. And it, because this is a highly prominent cognitive architecture, and you can see this, this has been used in many, many applications. So, from studying creativity, studying aspects of perception, memory, motivation, and so forth. 
<coughs> and this is also the cognitive architecture that's most frequently used in the field of recommender systems. The advantage of using this cognitive architecture is so we can can use it to collect quantitative measurements when we do experiments. And in the architecture, we can combine or compare quantitative measurements with qualitative um, measures and quantitative measures that we can observe when we do when we directly work with human participants. I'd say this is a, this is a, a cool advantage of this um, um, approach. <coughs> Sorry. Um, what the Cognitive Architecture Act are, it was published in 24 by, by Anderson et al. And what I would like to now show you is, is related to, again, to memory research. Um, what is described as one part of the cognitive architecture is how memory is activated in our brain. So activation processes and activation processes mean so um, the more act or the higher the activation of a memory unit in our in our uh, memory system, the easier it gets, it can be retrieved. So it can be easier accessed in our memory. So this is then important for many tasks. What <laughs> ACT R has, so it also has in terms of a very simple structure. So it has also a central register where the information recorded from, from the surroundings are, is stored and, and encoded. Encoded means like, if you remember, bound to temporal and spatial context. Then it has a working memory structure and this corresponds to the short-term memory structure in the atkinson schifrin model. So information is only stored for 10 minutes. And then it has a long-term memory structure. And this one is split up into two types of memory structure, and namely the declarative memory, which holds like the factual information and the procedural memory, which holds rule-based information. So like how to do something, how to write it back and so forth. And I'd like to focus now on this declarative memory part. Um, because here, um, two important or, well, or an important uh, mathematical function is described, which is called the activation e equation. And the activation equation is exactly that. So if a memory unit is very important for you in the current task, it has a high activation. So you can memorize it efficiently and quickly. And this is composed of two terms. The first term is the base level activation of the memory unit. So this is like the general usefulness for you and the <coughs> associative activation of the memory unit. And this is how relevant the memory unit is to some context cues that you have, that you experience. And this could be like your current mood or something, your current emotion. What is now, if we now look into this equation for the base level learning equation, <coughs> this is then this BI, and this is uh, an equation that integrates the past usage frequency, so N, so how often you have used the memory unit, and the recency of E, so how long ago you have used the memory unit. So this is then the timestamp. And um, if you see this, um, this has an exponent minus t. So if we see this now from a mathematical perspective, this amounts to a power law function. So we have now information that has been used frequently and recently um, that has then a higher base level activation. And this base level activation then decays over time following a power law function. And why this is important, I can show you now in the next slides, where we did an own experimentation to apply this base level learning equation to model user behavior and to account for temporal dynamics of user preferences. <coughs> so we, both Marcus and I, we work a lot on music recommendation systems. I think Marcus had a tutorial in Music Rexis a few years ago 
at one of the web conferences. So you might know his work also <laughs> from previous tutorials in this realm. In our, indeed, in our joint work, we are now looking a lot into like biases and fairness of algorithms. And in particular, we're very much interested in finding models that better serve users who suffer from biases. And I think in the domain of music recommender systems and in the domain of recommender systems in general, popularity bias is a crucial bias. So that means pop that popular items <coughs> are more likely recommended compared, compared to like long tail items. <coughs> Sorry. And that's maybe, I mean, I think this is, there has been, have been many studies that have shown that popularity bias indeed is an issue in, in recommender systems applications. Problem is, so if you are a user who has a very niche taste and you like music that is not popular, you receive less good recommendations. And of course, this is, this is great. This is not great in terms of user satisfaction. This is not great in terms of the system provider wanting to serve all the user base very nicely. And of course, you can like create an algorithm, you can introduce like regularization, you can introduce like post filtering and everything, yeah, of course, to mitigate these issues of popularity bias. But we in our work, we wanted to understand why this happens. And we wanted to provide, we wanted to provide a novel model that serves better the consumers of low mainstream music. So this is like the background story for this. And since we work on psychology informed recommender systems, we wanted to see if we can employ findings from psychology to, to come up with such a model. So in terms of the experimental design, uh, just a few words about this. <coughs> so our aim was to develop an algorithm that predicts the genre preferences for low mainstream music listeners, video mainstream listeners, and high mainstream <coughs> music listeners. Um, by the way, we also did like recommending artists in the later, in the follow-up studies, but I show you here the work on genre preference prediction. And in our approach, we employed a data set that um, was crawled from last FM that c consists of 1.1 billion listening events. Listening events means so you have a user, you know which user listened to what artist, album or track name at what time in uh, what point in time. Plus in this data set, what is really great is it, it um, contains a so-called mainstreaming score. And the mainstreaming score is computed as like the overlap of a user's listening history um, with the aggregated listening history of all the last FM users in our data set. So you could have them for each user see, so if the user deviates a lot from the mainstream, um, then um, the score would be, <coughs> would be lower if the user deviates a lot from the mainstream. And based on this score, we could then create like three groups of users based on this mainstreaminess. Because we wanted to understand what's going on with the slow mainstream users. And we also wanted to see, so if this bias indeed exists and how we can mitigate this. Um, in, since we wanted to use a psychology informed user model, we were then looking for interesting patterns in our listening behavior of the users in our data set. So what we did, we investigated specifically this, this temporal dynamics of listening behavior um, because we wanted to see if there's some patterns that fit to our memory activation processes. So what we did then is we plotted basically the so on the on the y-axis of these plots, you see for each user group, we plotted the re-listening counts of genres on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we cut, plotted the time since the last listening event of genres. So we wanted to see of this recency and frequency um, that we've seen in this act R base level learning equation also can, can somehow be seen in our patterns, temporal patterns of music consumption. And you might have seen, realized this. So this is a log-log plot. 
So this is the log of the re-listening count of genres and the log of the time since the last listening event. And if we now look at this data, we see that the trend, so the temporal dynamics follow a time dependent decay function. And since this is a log log plot, um, is, it is almost a line. So and whenever this happens, then we know that this is power law distributed. Um, so for comparison, we fitted a linear regression also. So this line that you see is the linear regression line. And we did this for all the three user groups. And we see that the listening behavior of all the three user groups follows exactly this time-dependent decay function. So the more recent somebody has listened to a genre and the more frequent and the, freak more, the higher its frequency that the user has listened to the genre overall, it, it, the higher its re-listening count. And this, fo this follows so nicely this base level learning equation from this human memory model. This is like, yeah, it's crazy. So basically what we did then is we could exactly use this, this equation to design an algorithm to predict the genre that the user is going to listen to next. And um, this is exactly what we, what we did. So we created an algorithm using this mathematical form <coughs> um, uh, equation. So we computed for each, for a genre, for a user, the base level activation. Um, yeah, we normalized this then and then pre predicted the top K genres. So the top K genres were then the ones that had the highest activation. And we could see that with this algorithm, which we termed BLLU, we could improve the recommendation quality for all the three user groups compared to several baselines. So also we had a time, another temporal baseline in there that was similar to our approach, but that used an exponential function or the power law function. But interesting enough, so we could have the most substantial improvements uh, with this algorithm for the listeners of low mainstream content. So the listeners of, of low mainstream content seem to have, they seem in their user behavior, these recency and frequency patterns were the most pronounced. So they seem to have a very individualistic behavior. So they seem to reconsume their the content that they have consumed already uh, more often than, for instance, the high mainstream user. This was great. So this was because in the end, so this implementing this, this power law function more or less is a very simplistic a computation efficient approach. It's very transparent. So we can see the reasoning of the algorithm very nicely and it can deliver more accurate recommendations. <coughs> I think this is a great success for psychology informed recommender systems. Are there any questions in the meantime? No, I don't see any. Not really. Okay. Um, so ACT R is in this in this sense a, a great um, source for coming up with new algorithms. Um, there are also other interesting and relevant components of this declarative memory part in ACT R, also of the other memory components in ACT R. So what the <laughs> declarative memory component also features, so it has this base level learning component that we have used. It has a spreading activation component. And this is great because it lets us model co-occurrences with other items. And this is particularly relevant for um, music, the domain of music, for instance, because music is very frequently consumed. So the items are co-listened to, to others. <laughs> then there's a partial matching component to model similarity between items. There is a valuation component, which is also very helpful because we can model familiarity with items with that. And this is also something that, mus that psychology tells us, um, which is called the familiarity principle. So the more familiar we become with items, the more positive are our emotions that we develop towards these items. And there, there's a noise component to account for, of course, randomness in user behavior as well. <coughs> so in a, in a follow-up study um, that we have presented last year at the Rexis conference, um, we also 
utilize these other components um, of, of this declarative memory component of ECT-R. Here we um, wanted to predict the next items in a session. So then the tracks that a user is going to listen to in a listening session. Um, we also used the data set from last FM in this experiment, um, um, which is called LFM2B. So it's, an, it's a newer version of this LFM data set that, I've, that we have used in this, in this previous paper. We categorized or we, we clustered sessions into listening sessions of 30 minutes, 30 minutes <coughs> for this experiment and compared our prediction approach to even more um, baselines. And we found, so it, the findings some, some, somehow, co so they corroborated our earlier work, so that recency and frequency of, of listening behavior are effective predictors to predict the next track in a listening session. But here, um, adding co-occurrence between items and familiarity, even further improves the prediction. And yeah, like I said, so this is very particular about music, music behavior. So music tracks are frequently co-listened to with others. <coughs> In terms of memory, what I also would like to, to highlight here is that we not only can employ mem findings from memory research to design algorithms, but we can also create recommender systems or use recommender systems as a way to support our uh, limits in, in or to, to me help mitigate our own limits in terms of memory. So in our memory, I mean, so we suffer from cognitive overload. So when there's too many items, we suffer from, so we, for, we tend to forget um, items quite, quite quickly, especially in terms of short-term memory. And here in this paper by, by Tobias Schnabel et al. from 2016, so what they did is they, they proposed to support uh, use a short-term memory by creating some sort of digital short-term memory um, using a recommendation approach. And in this digital short-term memory, so when a user was browsing, for instance, a catalog of movies, um, in these digital sh short-term memories and the items that the user has <clears throat> recently or currently considered are stored there. So it's kind of like a bookmark uh, that is then helping the user remember what, what they have checked out before. And we mentioned they did a user study with that and they found that <clears throat> really user satisfaction was increased a lot. So the decision quality was improved. So this approach uh, nicely helped them support support the user when they were browsing large large item catalogs. And of course, in terms of having a recommendation algorithm, this is great because this is kind of a, like an implicit feedback. So whenever then something is stored in this digital shortlist, then you can consider it or you can when you train your algorithm and learn more about the user preferences. <coughs> Then one, one cognition inspired recommendation approach that I'd like to just briefly go over is uh, case-based reasoning. You might have had experience with case-based reasoning already. Um, here, uh, the idea is to employ also findings from memory research to help users solve issues and have solve problems. The idea is to have like a reasoner, so a, a machine learning or a an artificial intelligence reasoner remembering previous cases that have been solved that are similar to a current case and then to use this previous case to solve new cases. So this is very, yeah, very frequently done in, in industrial settings. So where you have, I don't know, you have, you have a machinery operating machinery, you have encountered some problems. Um, these problems are then a case is documented with error codes and so forth. And then you have maybe a similar, similar problem with your machine and then you look into your knowledge base and find previous um, cases that help you solve the issue with your machine now. <coughs> so this is the analogy would be to have an, like an ex expert helping you um, with some problems. 
um, making decisions. And this is exactly how, how also we kind of solve problems in our mind. Typically, we also, when we, when we encounter a problem, like in programming, <laughs> computer programming, uh, we draw on previous learning experiences when we solve new problems. So we remember something that we have maybe some, some, some software that we have done similarly in the past to solve a new issue. And this is also a technique that was pioneered by cognitive scientist Janet Kolodner. <coughs> so in, the, in a way, so while there are a type of recommender systems on their own, there, there are early, also early examples of psychology informed recommender systems because the whole problem solving architecture was designed by psychologists, also the similarity metrics that are, that are employed in case-based reasoning recommender systems are heavily inspired by findings from psychology, such as the basic features of similarity. This is um, maybe something that you have heard already. Um, this is from Amon Tversky. So where um, similarity between items is derive not only based on their, their common traits, but also on their dissimilarities. So it's both the common and the distinct features are, are factored in. The disadvantage of case-based reasoning is definitely that we need a highly curated knowledge base. And this is why I'm saying it's typically done in industrial setting where there's a large amount of documentation of, of error cases or something like that. But the advantage is it's transparent and explainable because you have all the information out there. You do not have a, a black box algorithm at all. <coughs> yeah, I just have a slide with some examples of case-based reasoning recommender systems. <coughs> so one is the Wasabi system. So this is an early work by Robin Burke from 1999, where case-based reasoning is used to um, generate recommendations to provide recommendations in an e-commerce setting or to to recommend restaurants. Um, this was then also published by Burke in 1996. Then <coughs> case-based reasoning is frequently employed in travel recommendations where you typically also have like this very structured data of nice um, you go from one location to this location and then there you have metadata and so forth so there's a uh, the group of Francesco Ricci is working a lot on combining case-based reasoning with travel recommendations for example but also case-based reasoning has been used in music recommendations here in combination with uh, collaborative filtering <coughs> um, or to recommend investment portfolios because of course you also have a lot of structured data there in order to assist financial advisors in coming up with good portfolios um, for their clients case-based reasoning has been used quite a lot in educational settings, so providing recommendations, supporting learning tra trajectories, or to find content or um, find um, MOOCs that meets the personal interests of the learners. Yeah, those are just some examples of case-based reasoning recommendation systems. <coughs> Finally, um, the last cognitive inspired recommendation approach I'd like to highlight would be um, where we um, employ findings from attention that, um, processes. Attention is really crucial because it helps us process information or focus on specific information that is relevant to our task in the face of distraction and especially if we talk if we think about like web-based systems there's a lot of distraction of course and a lot of information so attention is really crucial um in, attention is also a huge topic in psychology in from in psychology um in psychology typically attention <coughs> or the psychologists describe attention in, in along four categories so <coughs> selective attention so where you have very focused on a specific object, alternating attention where your attention switches between um, 
objects or tasks, sustained attention where you have an intensive focus on a specific task, like if you would, I don't know, learn something if you're a, on a learning trajectory and diverted, uh, di divided attention where you have multiple topics that you need to like you know, divide your attention to at the same time. Attention is, is a dynamic process. And we know this from all the work that is not done in deep learning, of course, but also in also psychologists <coughs> model attention using dynamic models. So what they do is they they have what they call connectionist models. So those are like artificial neural networks or so neural networks with just one hidden layer. <coughs> and they also like try to um, yeah, employ neural networks to, to model these dynamic aspects. But in terms of like compared to computer science research, so they, it's not deep learning, it's, it's artificial neural networks. <clears throat> One example of such a model that I'd like to show you briefly would be the con <coughs> connectionist model sustain. This is a model of sustained learning. <clears throat> um, here, uh, the idea is to model like how humans mo learn about categories. <clears throat> so when you learn about new categories. So <clears throat> my go-to example is when a kid learns about animals. And the kid sees example of sees cats all the times and and has then <clears throat> this category of cats um, in their brain. So they know that's like four legs, a, ta a tail, and pointy ears. And then the kid sees a dog for the first time and sees okay, uh, four four legs, a tail, but the ears maybe are different and the size is different. And then the kid, so in the brain, a new category is formed that is not dogs. And then whenever the kids like encounters dogs, then the kid knows where to put the dog because they, they are similar, but uh, different in terms of their feature. And this is what human category learning more or less does. <coughs> so um, sustain has been used in the context of recommender systems to, to account also for user interest shifts. Um, and the, the experiment here that I present here was done in the context of supporting users with learning resources. So in the, in the domain of learning. <clears throat> so while the user was interacting with learning resources in the system. <clears throat> and when you have, when you do this also with a collaborative filtering algorithm recommending resources, you do not account for attention shifts or <clears throat> for focus changes in the learning. And what uh, this experiment did is like it computed the activation of a specific topic um, or the, the, the attention of focus of the user and then how well the resource fit to the current attention of focus of the users. And then it re-ranked the, the recommendations provided by CF using this attention of focus. <coughs> and I mean, I will not go into detail for that experiment in order to, in the interest of time, but what this approach also showed that it could, so like the prediction quality could be improved um, uh, compared to many baselines as well by adding this re-ranking function more or less uh, based on this psychological finding from attention dynamics. Um, the takeaways for this part, if there are no questions, I don't see questions in the chat. No, is that we can employ, so there are many cognitive models. Many of them exist and even more exist that, so um, that could be probably applicable to the task of recommender systems that the, than the ones that have been used already. And there's is a bunch of work that showed that Using these models can create, help create new algorithms, like in the case of ECHDR, can help mitigate issues of existing algorithms, like in the case of the Ebbinghaus curve or in the case of the sustain. Also, what's really great about this is that um, <clears throat> applying these models help us really understand digital behavioral data better. So we get a deeper understanding of user behavior because we know not only can observe these patterns in the user behavior, but we can find explanations for that. Also recommender systems can help um, with our limitations of our cognitive functions like augmenting human memory. And there are 
probably a lot more applications that could be exciting research topics here for the future work. Also, <coughs> use, shifts in user interests and attention are crucial issues in the whole field of recommender systems. This can be tackled using psychologically informed approaches. And of course, I mean, in terms of attention, so the, the search of deep learning has now created many attention-based approaches, but there's really not so much work that looks at the underlying psychological principles of why our attention shifts and how we can, can support this best. So I'd see there's a lot of potential for future research here. Um, because the advantage of using these psychological principles is that the resulting models are explainable. They are transparent. We can interpret it. We know why a prediction was done. Um, if we know the underlying psychological theory of that. <clears throat> so this is like lots of great research. And I hope many in this community here are taking this challenge of, of doing more, more work in this domain as well. And with that, I'd, if there are no questions, and then I'd hand over to Markus. So thank you very much for this very inspiring talk, in part mm -hmm. on inspired recommender systems. There's one question, I think. Yeah, sorry. Maybe sure. Where, where's my mouse? <laughs> <coughs> Which model should we use? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of like a tricky question, of course. I mean, so I think what is really great now is so there have been many works working with this ACT R theory. And this ACT R theory is so rich, and only a few parts of the theory have been used so far. So I would I would suggest going into this direction as a starting point, because there has been already experiences in this in this realm. And I mean, so what what we also do is so we 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 work a lot with cognitive scientists. So we show them data that we see, we show them patterns that we observe. And then we have this kind of like interdisciplinary view on, on the data. So this is then, I think this is then a, a good way to do it. But yeah, like I said, so ACT R, I think it has, is so rich and it, so for instance, this procedure memory could be nicely, nicely exploited in, in, in further work. I hope this answers your question to some extent. Thank you. So, oh, there is some more in the chat. So, okay, yes. Good. So, thanks again a lot. I'll take over since we have like well, 11 more minutes until the break. Uh, I'd like to start with, uh, well, the use of uh, a very common um, concept from psychology, uh, which is personality or personality traits and it's used in recommender systems. So what you learn in the following, well, like half an hour uh, is basically the following. So first I'd like to give a little bit of a motivation why it makes sense or why it might make sense to include such personality traits into a recommender system at all. Then we'll dig a little bit deeper into how we can acquire personality and how we can model it. So there are a couple of psychological models that can be used since personality has been researched for quite a couple of decades in the uh, field of psychology. Uh, and then I will or will process uh, more towards the relationship between personality traits on the one hand and preferences for certain kinds of items for certain kinds of content, which is then of course important to integrate personality information into recommendation algorithms. So again, if there are is any question, then just post to the chat and answer them later on. So why is it important or why does it make sense to include concepts such as, such as personality, but also later on mood and emotion, as we'll see into a recommender system? Well, if you review the literature, then basically you see two predominant reasons of why this is done, which is to alleviate the cold start problem and to further personalize recommendations uh, with respect to diversity needs. 
to probably or most of you working on recommender systems uh, know what we mean by cold start problems. So this is when a new user or a new item uh, comes into the system, then we're well, focusing on the user. We don't know anything about this user uh, yet upon registration. Um, so one thing that we can do, so in particular with the single sign-on functionality where the user just uses their you know, Twitter or Facebook or Google account to sign in, is that the system could extract well with some accuracy the personality of the user and use this kind of to uh, start creating some initial recommendations. And this can be done for instance, by matching the user's personality with what is often referred to as the personality of an item, which is a bit of a questionable concept, I would say, but we'll come back to this later. Or it could, uh, well, rely on user models that have shown that personality correlates with certain preferences. So for instance, neurotic people might have a preference uh, for heavy metal music. Uh, the, other, uh, the other reason why personality is integrated into recommender systems is, as already said, to tailor the level of desired diversity in the recommendation list. So again, the first thing uh, such a system would do is to extract the personality very often from the user-generated content, so from uh, microblogs, for instance, or even from images shared on Instagram. Then such a system could use or could adopt a two-stage approach. So in the first step, it would use a standard collaborative filtering-based approach, which would then result in a list of potential candidate items for the recommendation list. And then in the second step, such a system would uh, adopt a re-ranking approach. So it would re-rank or give different weights to the items in the initial recommendation list, depending on such models that identified correlations between personality traits and the desired level of diversity that the user might want in the recommendation list. So to give a very common sense uh, example here, it has been shown that users who are open to new experiments uh, have a higher need or a desire to more diversity in the recommendation list it makes immediate sense, right? If I'm very open to new experiences and, and like new endeavors, then it's very likely that I will also like to learn more about maybe new uh, artists or movies that I've not been uh, exposed to before. So now, how can personality be modeled? Uh, as said, there, well, studying a psychological literature, there have been proposed a lot of different models. Uh, however, when it comes to research on recommender systems, there is one predominant model that is used in more probably 95 or so percent of the, uh, of the, the research works on personality by recommender systems. And this is the so-called five-factor model or big five model, or sometimes also called just ocean model. Ocean, because it contains uh, five factors or five dimensions along which the personality of a user, of a human in general, can be described. So O refers to openness to new experience, which I just mentioned. So how curious a person is versus how cautious. C refers to conscientiousness, which basically means how organized a human is versus how chaotic uh, he or she is on the other hand. Extroversion probably doesn't need a lot of explanation how outgoing, how extrovert a person is. A for agreeableness actually refers to how compassionate, friendly a person is. Uh, whether kind of he or she always agrees with what has been said, or on the other hand, on the other extreme, a person that is very critical thinking, always questions things he or she learns or gets to know. And the final point, the final dimension is neuroticism. So kind of how neurotic of, co or neurotic of course, how emotionally stable a person is. So sometimes, also, ES for emotional stability is used as uh, synonymous for neuroticism. So we have these five dimensions according to the five-factor model. 
Uh, and according to the model, you can now describe each human along those five dimensions on a numeric scale, for instance, between one and seven from, uh, yeah, applies very strongly to, uh, does not apply at all, well, or rather the other way around, does not apply at all would be one and applies very strongly would be seven. And we can do this as set over each of these five traits. So basically, mathematically speaking, you would end up with a five dimensional feature vector, if you want to call it like that, that describes a user's personality. And there are, of course, uh, a lot of psychological measures and different scales and instruments, questionnaires, and so on, in order to kind of ask questions that are then translated into uh, corresponding values for each of these dimensions. And a very good source is the IPIP, the International Personality Item Pool, if you want to know more about how exactly to do this. <clears throat> and this already brings me to the question of how we can acquire personality traits. So basically there are two different strategies. The one is questionnaires, asking users, conducting web service, for instance, and, and using well-defined standard instruments, questionnaires from psychology, or personality traits, according to the ocean model, can also be acquired through, well, nowadays, uh, these large amounts of user-generated data, applying machine learning and deep learning techniques. So if you compare the two, not very surprisingly, the questionnaires being based on a lot of empirical evidence from psychology tend to be more accurate, but of course also requires uh, more labor from the participants, from the users of such a system, which also means kind of from a uh, financial aspect of, of kind of researchers, it's more expensive, of course, to acquire this information. On the other hand, we have machine learning approaches that automatically infer personality from user-generated data. They are less accurate, but also less expensive. And of course, sometimes a, a mix of the two is done. So uh, sometimes you just uh, yeah, conduct a web survey in order to obtain a rather small amount of personality information, which you then use to train machine learning approaches uh, and extract, for instance, uh, based on the model that is created from this kind of ground truth collection, real users to then adapt the model to extract information from microblogs or Facebook likes or even from sensor data. So when it comes to questionnaires, as already said, there exist a lot of different uh, types of questionnaires. Uh, they vary in particular according to the number of questions that are asked and one well, well established rather uh, quick or small questionnaire is the so-called 10 item personality inventory or TP that as the name suggests, asks only 10 questions of forms like I see myself as disorganized and careless where the user is then asked to rate to much, uh, to which extent the statement applies to them from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And then uh, two of each, of each of these questions, or better, the responses of the users are uh, combined in a linear combination in order to get the final score for the O, the C, the E, the A, and the N traits in the end. There is also uh, another second well-established questionnaire, which is the Big Five Inventory 44. So again, well, the name tells it, 44 questions are included. And this should, of course, be more accurate in terms of modeling uh, each of these ocean scores here. So questions are somewhat similar, but go more into detail. I see myself as someone who's curious about many different things. Again, users rate them and the final scores are computed as a linear combination of several of answers to several of those 44 questions. So I think now it's time to take a break. So I think now that you know roughly at least this, uh, what's behind this ocean model and how to use questionnaires to extract it, we'll take a short break now and then continue with automatically extracting personality traits. So I hope to see most of you back in 15 minutes. So at 
10.45. Okay, so before the break, uh, gave you a very brief introduction into why it makes sense to include personality traits into recommendation process. Then we talked about this infamous ocean model to model personality. Uh, and said that basically from the, or in the psychological li literature, there exists a lot of different so-called instruments. So basically questionnaires, how to uh, describe a user according to a different extent, those five uh, ocean or the five dimensions in the ocean model, um, in the ocean model, sorry, applies to. There's one question on the chat. Oh, okay, that was just your list. Okay, and then, of course, now in the days of machine learning and deep learning in particular, personality traits can also be inferred automatically based on foremost user generated data, including user generated content, but also sensor data, for instance, that are shared on different social media platforms. So uh, we'll just scratch a little bit on the surface here, of course, by mentioning a couple of common data sources that are used. If you want to know more and dig, dig a little bit deeper into how personality traits can be automatically predicted from the digital footprint of users, uh, we can point you to this uh, quite good survey uh, by Asukar et al, uh, published in 2018. So as with other traits, a lot of different uh, multimodal data sources has been used to predict personality. Not very surprisingly, among the most popular ones are texts. So most commonly uh, user generated uh, texts like microblogs that are shared on platforms like Twitter or Cinevibo in China, for instance. Uh, and of course, all the natural language processing research, in particular creating word embeddings and use them as features. Uh, to train a classifier and then predict the personality traits is a well, very common approach, of course. But personality has also been shown to be, to some extent, uh, predictable from images that are shared by users of Instagram, for instance, or on Flickr. Uh, and here, content-based features that can be extracted from images and subsequently used to train a classifier include very basic features like the color hue or saturation, uh, or even just certain uh, colors that appear. Um, yeah, but also range to more semantically meaningful features uh, like adopting object recognition techniques and or the presence of certain faces in the image or whether it's a full body image or just a portrait image and so on. So all of these has been used for the task of uh, personality trait prediction. Music also plays a very important role. So in particular, certain aspects describe the content of music pieces like the genre or the mood or instrumentation uh, can be used to predict to some extent personality. There is also a relationship between the intensity, the listening intensity or the uh, preferred level of diversity. Uh, of a music listener in the genre, for instance, in order to predict personality. So we'll come back to that later, to the relationship between preferences and personality, of course. Good. There have also, also been uh, research on using just the information on which content on Facebook users like to predict personality. Um, so probably some of you know this, my personality app or the resulting data set, which was well heavily uh, discussed and uh, yeah, deputed, so to say. Um, so that can be used quite accurately to predict personality. Another source is sensor data. So we all know uh, today we have the sensor packed smart devices like smartphones or tablet. Uh, and there are features like which apps we use, uh, data from the sensor data from the motion sensors, gyroscope accelerometers, and so on, can uh, result in, in movement patterns, which then again might tell you about personality of the user. Also, some metadata have been investigated, like uh, how much content a user shares on their through the social platforms, or how dense the friendship network is 
that also tells you something about certain personality traits, like extroversion, for instance. Uh, regarding to the machine learning techniques, uh, still the focus is more on the classical, on the traditional techniques like SVM, support vector machines, or decision trees, random forests. Uh, but also, um, well, deep neural networks, and also not only deep neural networks, but more classical uh, ones, for instance, like multi layer perception, have been investigated. Um, but very interesting set of focus is still on the more <coughs> sorry traditional techniques. Probably also due to the lack of very well annotated uh, data, except for some exceptions, like for instance, this my personality data set. Good. You might now wonder to which extent personality or the different personality traits can be predicted. Uh, and here I'd like to well, show you this, which I extracted from uh, this study, this meta study by Athuka. Uh, they investigated a thing, something like 16 or so different algorithms uh, and compared the performance. And actually, what you see here, the numbers, is the correlation between uh, the predicted trade or the predicted rating for the trade and the true rating. And you see here, there is quite a little bit of a gap. So you see that openness and consensuousness can be predicted well quite accurately so quite high uh, correlation still the other three have a pretty good correlation but there is some gap between them so openness consensuousness can be predicted best whereas extroversion ranked worst at least in the study so just to get some idea about what is possible so and now let's kind of uh, slowly move forwards to build a personality where recommender system. And of course, a core component of a recommender system is to know about the user's preferences for certain items. So it's worth studying the relationship between personality traits and item preferences. And in fact, many studies have shown that such a, pers uh, such a correlation exists for uh, certain personality traits investigated on different domains, of course. And these kind of this uh, valuable insights actually means that indeed personality might be a very valuable feature to include in recommender systems. So said there exists quite a couple of these studies. I just like to give you three examples here. So the first one related personality traits with preferences towards certain genres. Uh, and actually, Cantador investigated this for or in three different domains in music, in movies, and in books. So they used exactly this, uh, yeah, my personality data set. So, likes of uh, given on individual genres, a set, movies, books, and, uh, and music of more than 50,000 Facebook users. And then what they did is kind of in a statistical exploration study, averaged the personality or the score of each of the personality traits of the users who liked a certain genre. So basically this resulted in such, uh, such plots where you can see, for instance, here uh, they investigated the movie genres and here they investigated genres of books. Um, don't get confused by the coloring here. So actually the, uh, the color uh, scale that is adopted here is adopted in a column wise fashion in here. So actually for each color, the lowest values are in red and the highest values are in green. The same holds here for this uh, color. So what you can see here, for instance, is that uh, among or among those that indicated to like adventure movies had actually the lowest neuroticism score. So actually neurotic people tend to rather dislike adventure movies and to like, uh, well, uh, cultural movies here, for instance, or extroverted people tend to rather dislike animation movies and rather like drama. Here it's also, if we switch to book here, you see that uh, neurotic people tend to favor crime stories, for instance, but rather disfavor educational uh, educational books. 
whereas conscientious people tend to like educational books pretty much also agreeable people and so on but conscientious people tend to dislike comics for instance so this has been a, well, a preliminary study that tried to uh, find correlations between these personality scores and certain genres in these three different domains as already indicated uh, Another study was carried out by Chen et al. and actually studied the personality or the correlation between personality traits and preferences for diversity. So if you remember in the beginning, I uh, told you that um, adjusting the level of diversity of recommended content according to the, uh, the needs, the diversity needs of the users according to their personality is one of the main motivation why personality is included in the recommender system. And this can be based on this study, for instance, where Janet Al um, investigated 180 uh, Chinese users and investigated the correlation between their ocean scores and certain uh diversity metrics that are computed on different aspects of movies in particular the genres the director i think the release year as well and the country so this resulted in uh basically such a table so here in the raws you see well among some additional demographic information you see the ocean scores here and preference towards certain um yeah, diversities. So diversity was computed as the Gini index, I think, over the genres, the directors of the movie, the country of production, the release time, and the diversity in terms of uh, actors and actresses. And you see, for instance, here, not too surprisingly, there is a positive correlation for almost all of the diversity uh, measures and the openness trade. So, well, does make sense, right? If a person is open to new experiences, then they also appreciate diversity, and in particular, the diversity among uh, actors and actresses, and so on. There is also a couple of other ones, but there is not such a clear picture, of course, here. And that's just for, for illustrating that studies have shown that such a relationship exists. And finally, uh, it can become even more complex. So personality can also be studied in the context of uh, effective perception of, in particular, music. So the music domain was, indicate, uh, was investigated here in some of our own earlier work, where we studied whether users with different personality traits perceive emotions when listening to music differently. Here we conducted a study among more than 240 participants. We used a survey, so this 10 item personality inventory in order to elicit the, the personality of the users and actually then investigated how users with different personalities uh, perceive different effective or have different effective responses to the music listened to. So this was a the classical music piece. And you see, for instance, I don't, I cannot go too much into detail here explaining all of those, but if you're interested, please consider this, uh, this paper from Transactions on Effective Computing. But for instance, we found some, at least some mild correlations between openness to new experiences. So people who are open to them tend to perceive the music as more transcendent, more spiritual than users uh, that rank low on this openness. The same holds for joyfulness and in particular for, for tenderness here. Yeah. And these studies also showed some quite interesting, or gained some interesting uh, insights. So then now that we know that there does exist such a relationship between personality and different preferences towards certain genres of, of items, depending on the domain, or also certain preferences in terms of diversity, uh, we can have a look at the different uh, application domains of where personality is used in the recommendation process. And we see here, by reviewing the literature, that basically, well, the core recommendation domains are covered, but also a couple of niche uh, domains. 
So of course, personality has been in, uh, investigated in the context of movie recommendation, of music recommendation, images and books, all quite, uh, quite well-known and researched recommendation domains, also games, but also more specific domains like recipes, for instance, or recommending uh, people like conference attendees at scientific conferences or recommending certain groups that the user might want to join on social media platforms. This is maybe uh, the most one of the most important slides because this is basically describes in a nutshell uh, our insights gained through reviewing the literature on personality aware recommender systems. So this is basically the summary of that. So what we've seen is that most existing approaches that integrate personality into recommender systems are still quite simple. So some of them are even just standalone approaches. So only use personality of the users and items uh, neglecting other factors. Uh, <clears throat> so for instance, uh, well, in the simplest case, they just treat the personality of an item that can be extracted through the same uh, text-based personality prediction strategies as considering a user-generated content modeling the users. So they can just treat the personality inferred for the item as a content descriptors and then just using in a very straightforward way a simple content-based filtering approach to recommend uh, items that kind of have a similar personality than the items that the users consume. Or even more similar, you can, some of the approaches directly match the user's personality vector with this item's personality vector. But then, of course, there also exist uh, hybrid approaches that are based on a standard collaborative filtering or content-based filtering approach, but then integrate this personality information uh, either directly into an algorithm or adapt some uh, pre or post processing to reweight, for instance, or re rank the recommendation results created by a standard traditional recommender system. So, what they often do is they kind of uh, integrate different similarity measures. So, for instance, in this work here, uh, what the authors do is they compute the standard collaborative, collaborative filtering based similarity measure. Uh, with similarity based on the user's personality. Or this can also be done on the content-based level. So who et al, for instance, combine a content-based similarity with similarity based on the item's personality. So this is kind of extending standard CFOC EF approaches. As already said in the beginning, personality traits can also be considered a contextual factor. Um, of the users or even of the user uh, inter uh, item interaction situation, like for instance, modeled in a context aware factorization machine. It's done uh, in this work, Elliot al. Um, an alternative approach is to use a standard matrix factorization approach and integrate personality factors directly. So for instance, just adding them as additional columns to the user item interaction matrix and use them in the factorization process as done by Fernandez Tobias. But also graph-based approaches uh, have been used. So for instance, uh, this work here constructed a, a yeah, the user item graph where the nodes are users and items, and then extract subgraphs based on the similarity between the target users, uh, personality preference, and the other nodes. So kind of extracting subgraphs of users and item connections, which have similar on the containing the nodes, the user nodes and the connected item nodes of users that are similar in terms of their personality traits, and then. Uh, compute, for instance, uh, some graph embedding or using some uh, some random walk approach, for instance. Uh, one final thing, one final remark here is already uh, pointed to this. So, in particular, for the simpler approaches, we just match users and items, or basically describe items 
as a personality vector over the ocean's course. This is usually done by uh, extracting this information from user-generated uh, text, but of course, this well, kind of describing the person, uh, describing the personality, or even defining the personality of an item, somewhat seems quite quite disputable. So this is also one of the, the, the main criticisms of, of the research that does exactly that. Good. So now I'd like to give you one of two examples for recommender systems that integrate personality traits. And to start with some more, well, I wouldn't say niche domain, but at least uh, less frequently researched domain like the standard movie and music domains. I'd like to show you one example here to recommend computer games that is in this case only based on personality information. Okay, so basically a standalone approach, so to say, according to the previous slides, categorization. Uh, so I always organize the slides uh, in a, well, hopefully structured way uh, that I first like to show how users and how items are described and then dig deeper into the recommendation approaches and into how the approach was evaluated. So in this case, uh, Yang and Wang in 2019, the user and the items were modeled, not surprisingly, as a five-dimensional feature vector over the ocean's course. So this is referred to as UP, this vector, so the user profile, the user personality in this case. And this is predicted from the social media posts of, uh, well, I think Sina Weibo was used here. And then the items are modeled in the same way as said, but this time they investigated uh, two different data sources to predict uh, the ocean's course. The first one is that they took the ocean's course of the users who played the game, so kind of use them, the personality of the users playing the game as a proxy to describe the personality of the game. And the other strategy was to extract the ocean scores from the reviews of the game. So on the Steam platform, probably most of you know, uh, people can also write reviews in computer games and well, this can or are assumed by the authors to be usable to reflect what might be considered the personality of an item. So you, you see I'm quite cautious in yeah, claiming anything here. Good, and which recommendation approaches do they uh, implement now? As said, it's they, these approaches are based on only the personality information. So not very surprisingly, the approach is also quite simple. So they investigated three different variants of recommender systems. The first one is simply directly matching the user's personality extracted from the microblocks and the item's personality, so the game's personality, is set extracted either from the reviews or from the users, uh, microblocks of the users playing that very game. Uh, more formally, what they compute uh, in order to uh, define the similarity between a game GI and the user, UJ, is to just compute the cosine similarity, a very well established similarity measure between the user's personality vector and the game's personality vector indicated by the piece here. Second, they investigated a variant of content-based filtering um, that actually uh, investigates the similarity between uh, the game's target user played and the game uh, for which we want to compute the similarity, as you can see here. So this is basically a very standard uh, version of content-based filtering. So if we want to know the similarity between the game GI and the user UJ, uh, so UJ is our target user and GI is a game that has not been played by the user. So this is a potential candidate for being recommended to our user. Then what is done here is we just compute the average similarity between that unknown game, the game unknown to the user, and all the games that the user already has interacted with. So the CUJ is the games, is a set of games the user interacted with. Okay, and if we do this for all uh, potential candidates, uh, then we can just rank them and recommend the, those with the highest similarity between them. 
<clears throat> Good, and then finally, there is also uh, the third approach was just a linear combination between the two. So as you can see here, this hybrid similarity is actually defined as a weighted, the weighted similarity between, uh, well, using this direct user game matching. So what they call user-based similarity, the authors, I mean, and this game-based similarity. So they use a slightly different terminology, but I kind of translated it to more, I think, more standardized vocabulary. So because this is basically a, well, really a content-based filtering variant, which they refer to as, I think, game-based recommendation approach. So these three are rather simple uh, recommendation approaches for computer game recommendation using personality traits of users and items have been proposed. And to evaluate how well the approaches do, they conducted a user study on about 60 players um, and used the standard five point rating scale between one and five to investigate how well uh, the recommendations have been perceived. And they found that basically it is a content based filtering variant that, uh, that considers the games the users already played. Uh, the similarity to the unknown ones is actually performed best in the end. Mm -hmm. Is there any question here on the chat? I think nothing specific to this part. Okay, just motivation to. Yeah, attend exactly. So I, no, no, no. I, I tried to collect feedback for, mm. for, okay, for, thanks, for thanks. our crowd so that we see. Thanks a lot. I'm having a little bit of a hard time because I just have a single screen, so I don't really see immediately sorry. what's going on in the chat. Don't worry. I, I <laughs> Thank I you very much, <laughs> Elizabeth. Okay, thanks. Good. So as a second example, now having talked about uh, computer game recommendation, as a second example, not least because it's our, our uh, main area of expertise, I'd like to show you one example from the music domain, um, actually proposed by Lou and Tinterev in 2018. And this is actually a nice example of a re-ranking approach. So the two-stage recommendation approach uh, that uh, leverages both collaborative information, so user item interactions, but also personality information of users and items, plus an addition, well, not of items in this case, but in this case, really only of users, in addition to uh, a specific, I would call it diversity model, so to say. But you'll learn more about that in a couple of minutes. Okay, so it's a re-ranking approach that's based on collaborative filtering in the, in the first stage uses a factorization machine. And then in the second stage tailors the initial recommendation lists and adapts it according to the level of desired diversity in the recommendation list. So again, taking more data-centric perspective or data structural perspective, how are users modeled? Users are not too surprisingly, again, modeled uh, using the, the big five model. So the ocean model, ocean scores, five dimensional feature vector. In this case, um, not automatically inferred, but explicitly elicited through uh, questionnaires using the 10 item personality inventory. Items, on the other hand, are modeled using basically uh, editorial meta information, metadata, like the release year of a song, the artist, the genre, but also more content-specific attributes like the tempo or the key the piece was written in. Okay. And in addition, and this is important, uh, it uses a model that um, that describes correlations between the ocean scores and the needs for diversity according to each of these uh, item characteristics. So this correlation matrix was basically um, yeah, was basically computed based on another study in the previous user experiments conducted by the same authors, but will not go into detail here. So we just consider this correlation between the ocean's course and the diversity is, as fixed, basically. We've been talking a lot about diversity, but of course, we also need some metrics, some uh, quantification uh, for diversity. Uh, and here in this work, some well, very frequently adopted metric is used, which is the intralist diversity, so which is basically just the average pairwise distance between 
the items in the recommendation list where uh, these items, or the item properties are described by the genre artist and key because these were found to be the most informative, the most, uh, yeah, the ones with the highest correlations to any of the ocean traits. So this is kind of the, the data setting or which data is used by the approach. And now let's talk a little bit more detail about the very approach. It doesn't get very complicated, bear with me, uh, not a big deal. So as said, the approach contains two steps. The first one is that a standard, in this case factorization machine, is used to create an initial set of recommendations, an initial recommendation list, which is denoted by O in here, so the original list. Uh, that is trained on a quite standard uh, yeah, data set that is often used in music information retrieval and music recommender systems. So that is the, the million song data set, by the way. So we create an initial set of recommendations for a user, for our target user. And then in the second step, we create a new re-ranked list R, which will then turn into the final recommendation list. Um, and this R is created in the following way. So first, the, the top element from R is just copied from the original recommendation list to just the top item that best fits the user preferences. But then all the subsequent tracks that are added to this ranked list are added in a way that is minimize a certain objective function here. And this objective function is uh, composed basically of two different, two different aspects or functions here. The first one is the rank of the potential item to add, so P the rank in the, of the item in the original recommendation list. And the second one actually accounts for the diversity needs of the user given the user's personality traits. Okay, and this is kind of adjusted, this balanced, of course, using this additional uh, lambda factor in here. that can adjust how much kind of the, the purely accuracy or pure, purely utility-based rank contributes and to and balance that with uh, the contribution of this diversity uh, function. So this diversity is actually, or this overall diversity is computed as a linear combination, as you can see here, uh, over the individual average diversities when adding the candidate item from O to the new re-ranked recommendation list, okay? So this diversity tells you uh, what would be the diversity of the whole recommendation list R if you, if you added the item P to the recommendation list, okay? And these are, uh, yeah, basically different of these uh, diversity functions or diversity measures are used, as already said, depending on certain characteristics of the music in this case. So diversity is computed over release years, artists, genres, tempo, and so on. So as I said, for the final recommendation, only three of them are, are used. So kind of this part here, so the rank is a very standard way. So we just want to minimize, of course, the rank. So take the highest ranks, so give preference to the items that are highest ranked in the original list, but also adjust for the diversity. And without going too much into detail, I said this kind of correlation matrix between the individual personality traits of the users, of the listeners in our case, and the diversity needs has been pre-computed through some other studies. And from this, these diversity scores, these individual diversity scores are inferred. And as you can see here, uh, don't get bothered here. So ES is that stands for emotional stability. So this is equivalent to the neuroticism dimension in here. Okay, so you see there is actually a lot of components here, but I think yeah, that's a really, really interesting approach uh, of a two-staged hybrid recommendation approach that integrates both collaborative information using collaborative filtering approach, and on the other hand, tailors the level of diversity in the recommendation list according to the assumed need for diversity or preference for the diversity based on the personality traits of the user. 
of course, this approach has been evaluated as well in this case in a well rather small user study, including 25 participants uh, who were then asked to judge the perceived quality, diversity, and user or satisfaction of the recommendation list. And not too surprisingly, the re-ranked list outperformed just using this initial well, original list O. Good, are there any questions for now on this personality aware part? I don't, I don't see any questions. Just give me time to drink a bit of water. Okay, good. So if there are no questions, then let's proceed with the, the last or the last but one part of the tutorial, which is affect aware recommender systems. So similar to personality, affect, consider the psychological construct. Sorry, sorry, Marcus, to interrupt you. Yeah. Marcus, sorry to interrupt you. Now there is a question. Now there is, is a. Is there any, any yeah. that use predicted personality? Um, prediction of personality. So you mean, uh, is there any work that use machine learning personality for the recommendation process, or is there any work that predicts personality automatically? Ah, okay. Uh, no, actually, some of the works used uh, use personality uh, automatically extracted as well. Okay, so this was kind of uh, exactly what was what was done in the in the computer game example here. So I intentionally choose one example that used predicted personality and one example here for the music domain. So the the Lou and Tintere work that used personality based on uh, on responses of two questionnaires. Uh, but as said, uh, Masahiro, you'll find a lot of additional material in our survey article if you want to dig deeper into that. I would say that maybe even the, uh, the majority of works use inferred personality traits in the recommendation process, because it's, of course, quite timely and also costly to, autom uh, to well, elicit personality information through questionnaires. So we rather use a pre-trained model and uh, yeah, apply it to large amounts of user-generated data. Good, so if there are no more questions, then let's talk about this, another psychological concept, which is, well, effect, or at least it's an, it's an effect as an umbrella term for that, so effective cues. So what we will learn, how we'll structure this part, it will be a bit shorter than uh, the personality aware recommender system because there is also less work on, on affect awareness here, but still I'd like to start with a definition of what we mean by effect or effective cues and why these can be used or beneficially used, integrated into the recommendation pipeline. Then I'd like to briefly introduce the three most important models for effective cues, particularly for mood and emotion. Then we'll again briefly talk about how effect can be acquired, can be leveraged, oh yeah, can be elicited, and then how effective cues can be used beneficially for the recommendation process. So first need to start with a, a yeah, something where there is a little bit of a discrepancy between psychological literature and uh, literature more from the machine learning or artificial intelligence perspective. And this is the very definition of certain categories of effective cues. So whereas in, in the AI, computer science, machine learning, and most of the recommender systems literature accordingly, uh, these concepts of emotion and mood are often used interchangeably from a well, psychological perspective. They're not at all interchangeable. So that's why I want to start distinguishing a little bit between the two and raise awareness that there, is a, there, there are important uh, differences between the two. So emotion uh, versus mood it is basically. So emotion is kind of a, uh, an effective experience that is a response to a certain stimulus, okay? So that has a high 
intensity, for instance, if I show you an image of a, a crying child or a war, terrible war scene, then this will probably cause uh, no anxiety or fear or anger, maybe even. So this is a direct response to a certain stimulus that can be a text, can be a music piece, of course, can be an image and so on. But such an emotion only lasts for a very short duration, so usually a couple of seconds to at most a couple of minutes. Where on the other hand, we have this concept of mood, which is a longer lasting uh, effective experience. It has a longer duration, certain, well, many minutes up to several hours, and at the same time has a lower intensity. And it's important in some settings at least to distinguish between the two. So uh, now we know this, uh, what is now the main, the main rationale to include either emotion or mood information into the recommendation pipeline? First one is very often can be used to increase uh, the amount of personalization of a recommendation list, quite similar to what we already learned in the music domain in this last example. Uh, adjusting the music recommendation list according to uh, the diversity needs given by different uh, personality personas, so to say. Second motivation is that, uh, especially in the entertainment domain, items like movies, images, and predominantly music, to be honest, are used to regulate the mood of the users. And if we can integrate mood information into the very recommendation process, it can help regulating the user's uh, mood and actually bring them to a well better or maybe sometimes even desired more uh, sad mood. And finally, uh, quite some research deals with investigating the relationship between item preferences, personality, and mood. So for instance, the study I cited earlier uh, yeah, it's this classical music where uh, the office investigated how, um, yeah, based on the personality, how they perceive certain uh, emotional categories in music. So, how can effective cues now be modeled? Um, there exists basically three basic flavors or uh, yeah ways how to model effect. There is the categorical model, the dimensional model, and then hybrids of the two. So categorical models, uh, well, date back quite a couple of decades. And the idea is very simple. They just describe or just assume that a fact can be categorized into distinct categories. So one of the most uh, common, the most popular example is Ekman's six basic emotions. We studied that in the context of images uh, first. Uh, and actually, um, yeah, such typical categories of so the six basic emotions uh, constitute of happy, sad, uh, disgusting, fearful, surprising, and anger in the end here. Uh, this is a very basic emotion model, and it's kind of a general purpose model, but it is not necessarily suited to describe uh, effective responses in all domains. So for instance, it has been shown, and we realized this ourselves in some of our work, that this is not at all suited when you want to describe music or emotions that are uh, yeah, caused by, by music. So for these domains, for certain domains, other specific, more specific models do exist, like the GEMS model, for instance, for the music domain. So we have categorical models. Uh, emotions or effective cues are clearly uh, described by distinctive categories. The other uh, very important, very popular model is the so-called dimensional model. So it basically assumes that each and every motion can be described along two or sometimes three dimensions. So there's a continuum among those dimensions. Um, very popular is the so-called Wayland's arousal model, where actually well, one dimension is Wayland's, the other is arousal, where Wayland's describe uh, how positive or how pleasant a certain emotion is from very positive or very pleasant to very negative or unpleasant. Arousal, on the other hand, describes how intense the emotion is perceived, high intensity to low intensity. 
And sometimes a third dimension, often referred to as power or dominance, is added as well. That basically describes how much am I or how much is the, the user or the person in control of their emotion. So we have the categorical model, the dimensional model, and sometimes these models are also combine to form hybrid models that basically use these categories, each of these categories, as a continuous, uh, yeah, along a continuous dimension and actually uh, describe the emotion using, for instance, again, a rating scale, but this time not along valence arousal, but along uh, whichever categorical model uh, is underlying. So just to give you one example, this should become more clear, hopefully, in a couple of minutes. So this is actually Russell's uh, two-dimensional circumflex model that is one of the the most famous models as said, we have along the X axis, we have valence or positive versus negative uh, an emotion is, and we have along the Y axis the arousal, so the intensity of the emotion in this case. And you see here that you can also somehow uh, combine these two models already here. So actually the cat categories can be mapped, of course, onto the valence arousal space here. It's also been investigated empirically through user studies in this case. You see, not very surprisingly, pleased, excited, or excited here has a more, a higher arousal than just pleased. And considering the positive, positively valence, so to say, components, you have miserable here, negative, but neutral arousal, you have sleepy here also well, not really positive nor negative but a very low arousal not too surprisingly so and this is an example of a hybrid model so the geneva emotion wheel in this case that actually has already uh, set uses a set of categories in here so hate disgust fear disappointment so this basically the standard six emotions and then quite a few additional ones, regret, guilt, shame, and so on, pride, and so on. So they are kind of arranged roughly according to the valence arousal uh, plane. But then the important thing here is that within each of these categories, the users can select to which extent the respective category applies to the current affective state. Okay. So again, for instance, here on this yeah, seven point Likert scale. And this is basically a combination of categorical and dimensional models. So now that we know about the very basic models, categorically dimensional and hybrid models, the next question is again, obviously, how can we acquire effective cues? And one important thing is that unlike uh, personality, traits that are known to remain stable over usually years or sometimes even decades, uh, effective cues, well, as just said a couple of slides earlier, uh, are much more dynamic, of course, which makes it to some extent more difficult to elicit them or in particular to uh, realize the changes uh, in the Wellens arousal space, for instance, if we uh, during consumption of a, of a movie or a music piece, for instance. But on a more general level, again, uh, effective cues can be either required explicitly, we can just ask the users, or they can be inferred through machine learning, deep learning techniques from user-generated data. Again, said before, for personality, when we explicitly ask the user about their current mood or current emotion, it's typically more accurate, but also more labor intensive and expensive. Um, usually how this is done is that uh, the interface just presents, for instance, well, four or six basic emotions as categories to the user, and then the user can just select which one it will they are currently experience most intensely. Sometimes, but this is a little bit harder uh, because you first need to communicate, to explain to the, the regular user what is meant by valence arousal. So this is not used that frequently, or if so, then just for, uh, well, with expert users. Sometimes the user is also asked to position uh, a cursor in the valence arousal space in order to elicit 
information about their affective state uh, in this dimensional model. Or you can, of course, also use machine learning to uh, infer to some extent mood and emotion from user generated data, again, less accurate, same time, less expensive. And similar data sources can be used, of course, social media, sensor data. Yeah, it's of course, I mean, the main difference is that it's more dynamic. So you typically need to consider a, a shorter time window to track changes between uh, yeah, changes in the emotion or the mood of the user, which makes it, of course, more complicated because if you consider, I don't know, Twitter or other microblogging services, really tracking uh, the changes is really hard unless a user kind of is continuously posts about their emotional state on, on Twitter and lets the, let the world know. And these are, well, for the good or bad, not so many users. <clears throat> so again, this slide summarizes kind of our main conclusions or remarks uh, for different recommendation approaches that use effective cues and also show in which domains they are used. So as already said, affect-aware recommender systems are, have been less researched than personality-aware systems. I said one of the reasons is probably that it's really hard to acquire the data and acquire accurately the data in particular since it changes uh, much more quickly than personality traits, for instance. This is also the reason why most approaches are still very simple, sometimes even simpler than uh, those that integrate personality. So very often it's just simple extensions of collaborative filtering or content-based filtering, or even just match the mood of an item, however this is described, to the current mood of the user. When it comes to, uh, to different domains, we also see that not so many domains are covered in comparison to personality awareness. Um, often, since certain, well, assuming that certain locations or points of interest cause some, some emotions, location aware recommender systems or recommender systems for locations that use uh, mood or emotion information or have been researched also for fashion. And not very surprisingly, and this is probably the most important recommendation domain for affect-aware recommender systems is music. So why is this not surprising? Uh, in fact, music has been, or uh, there exist psychological studies, empirical studies that identified why people listen to music. And the most important reason that has been found by all of these studies is to regulate the listener's emotions. So there is a really very tight connection between music consumption, music perception, and uh, emotions that are perceived or that are evoked in the music listener in the user. So given this tight connection, it is not surprising that music recommendations is one of the, the core application domain of mood and emotion aware recommendation approaches. So, but before digging deeper into emotions, we would also like to give you two examples, uh, into, sorry, <laughs> digging deeper into the relation music and emotion. I'd like to start with one example that is actually recommended for locations, might correspond to monuments or other points of interest, uh, which has been published by Ravi et al. in 20. 17. Again, we first talk about how users and items are modeled in here. So in both cases, these, uh, well, their work or the, uh, their approach is based on uh, social media data, so on posts shared on the microblogging platform, I think, in this case. So basically, they adopt, they do not adopt uh, some real some machine learning approach, but they just use a lexicon-based emotion uh, description approach. So basically, uh, based on a, on, a, on a fixed list and fixed lexicon of certain terms that relate to one of the basic emotions, they just count how often the, each of these terms appear in a social media post, and then end up with an emotion vector that describes a user. So in the easiest case, it's just the six basic emotions. 
I think the, the author scene used up to 20 dimensions, so up to 20 emotions. They do the same for the item, but this case, of course, uh, not focusing on, uh, yeah, since the items here are the locations, they do not consider the, uh, the user, but all the posts that have been shared at this specific location, so at a particular location, irrespective of the user. So doing this again, using the lexicon-based approach, uh, using up to 20 uh, emotional categories, they end up with an emotion vector for the item. And then what they, or how this um, information, so the user-specific emotion vector and the item-specific information vector is used. Uh, for recommendation, they define three different recommendation approaches, user-based collaborative filtering, item-based collaborative filtering, and the hybrid approach. So um, for the user-based collaborative filtering, basically they use an approach, not surprisingly, uh, is very similar to, uh, to the standard, well, top N or uh, memory-based collaborative filtering approach. So they compute the similarity between our uh, target user, U, and the other user, so U is the target user. So they compute the similarity between target U and the other users, V, uh, as the product of two different similarity, of traditional similarity measures in here. So the first one, this S, M, O, user, is just a general emotional similarity between the target user U and our uh, users or other potential nearest neighbors to the target user U. Okay, so this emotion based, user based similarity is not surprisingly just the cosine similarity between user U's emotion vector and user V's emotion vector. Okay, the second one, so this part here actually considers the location as well. So this S user lock between U and V is actually computed as, again, the cosine similarity. But here, what is compared is the current emotion. So this is indicated here by now, the current emotion of our target user and the emotion that our potential uh, candidate or most similar users to the target user. So the emotion that this user V expressed, exhibited at a specific location, okay? So this kind of models the general emotional compatibility or similarity between uh, target user and potential candidate users, as nearest neighbors. And this one kind of models the specific location specific um, yeah, similarity between the two. So how the user, our target user is currently feeling, put in simple words, and how our other user felt when being at the location of interest. Okay. And then in a very standard, straightforward, collaborative filtering way, the similarity between users is uh, used to, uh, to identify the most similar users and the places they investigate, uh, they they visited and recommend those that are on top of the list. Then they also investigated an item-based collaborative filtering approach uh, that, uh, in a similar way to what I described a little bit earlier, just uses uh, the item similarity where items are described not by the ratings as usually done when. Uh, when adopting an item-based collaborative filtering approach, but the similarity that are uh, between items that are usually computed on the ratings are replaced by the similarity between the items based on their emotions, so based on the emotion vectors, exactly. So uh, except for that, it's just a standard straightforward memory-based item-based collaborative filtering variant. And then finally, they linearly combine the two approaches to the user-based and item-based collaborative filtering as well. So this was one example, in fact, for uh, or where emotions are extracted from 
social media posts, in this case from microblogs and used for location aware uh, for location recommendation. And finally, I like to uh, show two examples from the music domain. Uh, one that focuses only on music and the other that focuses on music and locations of point of interest. So this can nicely serve as a bridge between point of interest recommendation and the pure music recommendation. So actually, this is a very interesting paper by Kaminska et al, published at Rexus 2013. And here the task is that given a place of interest, like a, you know, a monument, a museum, a opera house, and so on, uh, to find music to consume at this place of interest so that matches this place of interest. So it can, to some extent, also be regarded as a as a retrieval task or approaching it from a recommender system perspective, the user profile, so to say, would be the location of the user. Well, as GPS coordinates from a kind of low level raw data perspective, but from a high level perspective, it would of course be the, the semantically meaningful place of interest to set, I don't know, the, the Eiffel Tower, for instance, or the Opera House in Sydney, whatever. <clears throat> so, here we have to deal with two entities, a set, a place of interest, and the music tracks, and we want to match the two. So how they model the place of interest is that they use a bag of words representation, uh, basically as a vector over 24 different emotional categories. Okay, so this is also a psychologically established uh, set of emotion categories. And basically what they did to elicit this information is that in a web server, they showed users uh, a description of a place of interest, so the opera house, for instance, and presented them with a list of 24 emotional categories and let them um, yeah, basically choose which of the emotions they would use to describe the place of interest. And basically uh, they did the same for acquiring information, emotion-specific information on the music tracks. So again, uh, playing the music tracks to users of a web survey uh, and also showing them the 24 emotional categories. So basically this means that both places of interest and music tracks are annotated using the same vocabulary. However, since uh, at least in this study, the number of music tracks by far exceeds the number of, of interesting places, what they did is they used this well annotated set of, I think it was 200 or 300 music tracks in order to predict uh, the emotional categories for a much larger catalog of music tracks to basically enlarge the, uh, yeah, the catalog from which music recommendations can be drawn and recommended to the user. And basically, the, the, they adopt what is often referred to as a music auto-tagging approach. So extracting audio features from the music items, training a model that uses these audio features to predict the 24 emotions, standard classification model, and then um, yeah, apply this to a much larger set of music tracks from which also audio features are extracted and use it to predict uh, the emotional categories for these unknown uh, music tracks. So that much for how the emotional content of places of interest in music tracks are represented. Now how this can be how can this be used to uh, affect recommendations? Uh, in fact they, investigate the office investigated different strategies maybe the most naive and most straightforward one that you can imagine is that you just since you have the place of interest and the music tracks basically represented in the same feature space what you can do here is you can of course just uh, compute similarity between the bag of words representations of the pois and the music tracks uh, here the Chakar index is used, uh, yeah, because we just have uh, we just have binary information, so whether uh, whether the emotion applies or does not apply here. So that's basically using yeah, the overlap between the two sets. <laughs> then uh, they propose to use a knowledge-based approach, which basically uses the DBpedia knowledge graph and searches for the place of interest and the music track and then computes or operates on basically different uh, statistics related to the paths between 
uh, the music item and the place of interest here. So like shortest path distance or uh, average number of bars and so on. So you'll find the details here in the paper. And finally, a hybrid approach that uses a, a very well-established rank aggregation technique. So the border aggregation, rank aggregation uh, between the auto tag and the knowledge-based approach has also been uh, adopted. Basically, the idea is that uh, these two approaches uh, complement each other and they consider different perspectives. So kind of the knowledge-informed perspective using the DBpedia knowledge graph and the other ones more based on uh, the emotion, emotional perspective. Similarity between the emotional descriptors between the two. So all of these recommendation approaches have been uh, integrated and implemented. And for evaluation, the authors conducted another uh, web-based survey, a user study using about 60 participants where the users were exposed to a description and some images of a place of interest and were shown the pooled results created by five different recommendation approaches. So next to the hybrid approach, which I just presented and the standard, uh, the standalone knowledge and auto tagger based approach, they also consider just a simple personalization approach where they recommended uh, just songs from the same genre as the target user indicated to like in the beginning of the user study. So all of these results were pooled and the user was asked to tick which of the, recommend, uh, of the recommended music pieces they uh, yeah, found suited when being at a specific place of interest or point of interest. Okay, and those performance measures that can just computed um, basically the likelihood or, well, it's not really the likelihood, but the, the, uh, the probability that when a recommender created a list of recommended items, then basically uh, yeah, the probability that the user would also tick those items as suited for, uh, well, to match the place of interest. Okay, so it's basically the relative frequency that is used in approximation for the probability. Good. So since there are no questions right here on the chat, I'd like to come to the last example here, which kind of, which I particularly like, not last because we, uh, it nicely shows how uh, music and art, or research and art can be combined. So actually this is um, a user interface called Emo MTB or music where music tower blocks that we actually presented last year, on my team at the, one of the largest media arts festival that happens in Linz every year. So the so-called Ars Electronica festival. And basically here, the idea is that uh, we investigated a collection of about half a million songs, um, used audio features and genre information to automatically cast cluster these, uh, these music pieces. So uh, yeah, the clustering is then used to create basically a city-like structure. So uh, based on the audio features and the genres, uh, each music piece in the collection is mapped onto only two dimensions and each of the music pieces then described by such a block and very nearby blocks, so very similar uh, blocks in terms of their features are then stacked on top of each other, forming buildings or tower blocks as we call it, as we call them here. So actually due to this clustering, similar regions emerge that typically uh, yeah, comprise of similar genres. So color here is used to encode genre. There are also some overlaps, of course, but the idea is that very similar music pieces form buildings. Uh, a bit less um, similar pieces then form neighborhoods around the buildings and so on. This works quite, quite well, fortunately. Um, what is or where does the emotion come into play? Uh, what we also did is we extracted from Last.fm tags. So Last.fm is a, a music streaming platform and a general digital music platform where users can also assign tags to each music piece or also artists. 
So we use these tags assigned to the songs um, in order to infer emotion information here. So actually, you probably cannot see this, but this is actually a smiley that might indicate uh, that it, this is a sad piece, for instance, that the user is currently listening to. So and how's the matching then done? Well, the user can select using their smartphones his or her current emotion uh, according to, well, four out of the six basic emotions here. So uh, yeah, four basic emotion model. Or the user can also decide to automatically infer the current emotion on the microblogosphere, so from Twitter, using automated emotion recognition techniques. And then depending on what the user chooses, uh, the visualization changes as well, and tracks are reorganized according to their emotional content. So if the user selects, yeah, here is an example of how this looks like. So here is basically the genres that we use, and this is the, the interface basically that the user can uh, or is presented when operating or connecting to the interface by their own smartphone. So first they ask how they're feeling, so uh, happy, sad, angry, or fearful, and then they are represented a recommendation list that is reorganized depending on the emotion the user selects. So, no, it's not, but uh, if the user selects, for instance, they are in an angry mood, then all the angry tracks would be given more weight and would appear more towards the top of the recommendation list. So this, for instance, how such a, a city, an artificially generated city, would look like in a happy mood. And you see if the user changes to angry, for instance, then this would also change to weather. Uh, the tracks that are recommended are not surprisingly also in, uh, well, were labeled as being angry based on the last of M tags. Yeah, fearful, then everything gets foggy and so on. So if you're interested to know more, then there is also a teaser, a teaser video, which I well, which I linked here. I think we right now we don't have the time to show it. But this was a very nice project. I'm pretty proud of it as you as you can imagine. So are there any questions asking again and giving me the time to sip at my coffee? There is actually a question in the chat by Masahiro hmm? um, on yeah, what I items. Can... Do you want to read it for yourself? Oh, uh, well, you can read it, but this is pretty long, right? So if yeah, yeah, yeah. you can read it a lot as well. So if terms in one domain tend to evoke emotions, this mean emotions are important in recommendations for that domain. I think there are two causal relationships, consumption of items, evoked emotion, current emotion shows of items to be consumed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, mm. sure. <clears throat> there is that is actually a very, a very good point. Yeah? That's a very good point. I mean, not, not only here, but the general causality versus correlation problem, right? Mm -hmm. And all of them are, are intertwined, of course. I mean, there is this, uh, yeah, continuous, um, yeah, a amplification of emotions, of course, as well. So, yeah, and also yeah. like in the terms of whether emotions are the emotions that a person currently feels while they're consuming an item that influences the choice of items, like you have put it so nicely, or the em emotions that are evoked when consuming an item. And I mean, we have discussed <laughs> this yeah. issue and how to quantify this, how to measure this and account for this many times. But in the, to, to be honest, so there is no real good solution. I mean, you can do, of course, smaller scale user studies and asking people. And I think, Marcus, we have talked about writing such a paper at one point already. But it's a non-trivial task, of course, and specifically in the context of music recommender systems, it's a it's a tricky thing, right? It's really hard, yeah. In particular, since music is known to evoke such strong emotions, yeah. So to which extent they are kind of am, am amplified if you're in a sad mood already, and then listening uh, again to sad music, and this will kind of bring you in an even sadder mood. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This kind of a vicious cycle is, is something very, uh, very interesting and really approached in, in the music psychological literature. 
Uh, and I can add to that this even depends, so studies have shown that this even depends on the personality traits. So for neurotic people, uh, if they are in a sad mood, they usually want to continue listening to a little bit of melancholic music, whereas for all the other personality traits, if they're in a sad mood, they want to get out of it and uh, being exposed to something that evokes uh, more happy emotions. So all of this is super interesting and there is a lot of research that needs to be done here. And then this is also the, the, um, yeah, the goal of this tutorial, I would say, even to kind of bridge the gap a little bit between mm. the vast amount of psychological literature and the computer science literature, because very often they, they or experts in both domains, unfortunately, don't talk to each other. So kind of the computer science or, or AI researchers often just extract mood from uh, text, for instance, and do not even discriminate between these different categories. So for instance, whether we are talking about, again, in the music domain, whether we are talking about emotions that the composer had in mind or the composer wanted to evoke, uh, or emotions that the listener of the music piece uh, perceives while listening to the music, or whether it's evoked or the emotions that is really that the user really uh, the listener really feels. So all of these are well sometimes subtle differences, sometimes not so subtle. And then it of course even depends on of course the setting and the context. So there is not only the the composer and the listener, there is sometimes also, of course, the, the performer that even kind of uh, well applies their own style and might have the same, but might also have different, uh, different inclinations how emotions should be communicated in this case. So, I mean, all of these are by no means simple questions. Mm -hmm. No, not at all. I mean, so, I mean, so we. So the act R there's a paper um, where the act R model is also uh, this activation equation is basically extended so it accounts for the current emotion of a user in this case so where this paper was it was about gambling so <laughs> modeling the decision making of gamblers when they did some kind of games yeah and here of course emotion so a strong emotion shaped the the decisions and the the actions of the of the user quite strong and this is where where there's really a nice um, computational model of how the current emotion of a user um, influences the current decision making and how to account for that in a in a psychologically informed decision support tool but the, of course this is also not so much about like this link between the current emotion and the the evoked emotion because of course their um, emotion also becomes stronger depending on the actions of the other player so it would be quite an exciting exciting thing to study but it's a it's a matter of data as well yeah, yeah. eliciting this information mm -hmm. yeah. and that's also quite interesting to see right how the different mm. communities approach the task i mean very often from a computer science or data scientist's point of view, we just, I mean, we crawl the data and then try to infer as much as possible from the data. Whereas on the other hand, psychologists work very differently, right? Exactly. Yeah. So it's very, the, very... The, the individual go very deep and, and study these illicit information, mm -hmm. usually by conducting uh, empirically studies with quite a lot of, of participants but really aim at yeah, digging deep and, and learning. Yeah. Much and, there's a, and the follow-up comment, so maybe we can ask users about the emotion before the choice and after the consummation. This is actually a very good point. <laughs> and there are also are tools for that. So for instance, mood maps, so let a user use it, mm -hmm. uh, like assign a mood on a mood map or an emotion. <laughs> Um, and I think hasn't Nava done work in this field so where they asked users mm -hmm. um, when consuming movies or maybe music pieces in a user interface. And of course, this would give you a more, more, yeah, a more semantically correct assessment of the current emotion that the user uh, experiences. Yeah. yeah. It's still very, very individual, of course. I think, yeah, mm -hmm. we have done, Bruce has done, Bruce Verwerder also some you have done, yeah. studies 
there, it was for most students, of course, but uh, from a PhD student of mine, who's fair better. Um, yeah, they, they actually asked users before and after a stimulus about their emotions and the stimulus were highly emotion laden uh, movie excerpts, I think. So where music mm -hmm. again plays a very strong role, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think you can find this in the survey as well, in the survey paper. Mm -hmm. Good. But yeah, right. like lots of potential for, for future work. Exactly. And this bridges very nicely, of course, to the ground challenges. So uh, yeah, again, coming back to the three categories of psychology informed recommender systems. So you remember Elizabeth started give a very, very nice overview about cognition informed recommender systems, where a lot of research has shown that there is a strong link between uh, the behavior of a user and the memory, the cognitive memory processes of the user, which is not least exploited or leveraged by the ACT-R model that Elizabeth uh, detailed. Uh, on the other hand, uh, surprisingly little research has been conducted uh, to actually study how uh, recommender systems technology can actually support the cognitive human memory processes when uh, deciding on which items to, uh, to consume in a recommendation list or more uh, abstractly how to retrieve objects. So actually there is a few, there's been a few um, yeah, articles or authors that looked into that. So for instance, uh, Elsweiler, uh, proposed an improvement for information management tool that actually investigated how humans recover uh, from memory lapses, in this case in here. Then Gamble et al. also did a couple of, uh, couple of, of, of research actually investigating how human memory can be augmented um, basically, well, as I said, there is not a lot, but at least these two works show how important it, uh, how important, uh, yeah, context information is here to retrieve information from memory. But as I said, this is a really rather understudied task, which leaves a lot of avenues for further research. Second uh, grand challenge, and uh, Elizabeth already mentioned it during, uh, during her uh, part, it is very important to study the attention of users and not, uh, not particularly, of course, only from the, uh, you know, from the cognition process, but also this nicely connects to uh, these attention mechanism that attention mechanisms that are more and more often uh, used and integrated into deep neural networks. So this would be a very a uh, good connecting point between the two. So the, the psychological study of attention and the modeling, the kind of more technical modeling of attention by basically weight vector as it is in the case of deep neural networks. Okay, so this kind of really linking the psychological models of attention with uh, empirical results from recommender systems is still uh, very unclear and still needs to be explored much, much further. And if you could do this, then this could, of course, also be used to better explain the recommendations through this attention, uh, yeah, attention weights in our case, which would hopefully in the end also, uh, yeah, make the recommendation models more transparent. So the second part, we're dealing with personality-based recommender systems, uh, and here uh, we identify the following. Well, grand challenges where still a lot of research needs to be conducted. First one is that exactly how different personality traits influence the quality or the perceived quality of recommendation is researched for let's say some particular user groups or in some particular domains, but uh, there is no really conclusive, um, there are no really, yeah, conclusive or more general models that are valid over a large variety of domains. And if you think back of the study I showed you conducted by Cantador 
at all about the about this cross study in three different domains book movie books music and uh, movies then you see that in some cases these correlations are similar uh, so between uh, certain genres and, uh, and personality traits these are similar between the three domains but in some they are not so in exactly this relationship between uh, the domains, the personality, and the genre are well, still under investigation. There's still some, some research needs to be conducted in there. And also, this highly depends, of course, on the user, on the individual uh, traits of the user. So in some cases, uh, users might be very open to receive recommendations tailored to the personality. In some cases, they might not. You might even consider this as a privacy threat, of course, because uh, all of this research uh, raises ethical questions, of course, to which extent should we as researchers or even worse, big companies automatically extract emotions or personality traits from the users. The last challenge, as we'll see here, and this uh, holds for both personality and also uh, ethic-based recommender systems, we've seen that most of the approaches are really very simple. They integrate similarity just as another factor into matrix factorization or linearly combine it with content-based similarity and so on. So actually, a lot of more research needs to be conducted into more sophisticated methods, also research how um, the kind of psychologically grounded, uh, uh, psycholo yeah, psychologically grounded personality models can be integrated with current deep learning technology. And last not least, personality on the item level. I already kind of said it several times. Uh, is still quite under researched, and this assumption that uh, you know the personality of an item can just be inferred automatically through their tags or reviews written about the item is still, well, at least disputable, I would say. Finally, uh, effective aware recommender system also here, the same holds, it's still not overly well understood to which extent effective cues of the users really, uh, really influence the recommendation quality. And, um, in particular compared to personality, emotion and effect are much more uh, dynamic concept. So this raises the question of how can we detect such changes? So this also relates to uh, the question that has just been asked on the chat and how to integrate, so how we can detect these dynamics and how we can integrate these dynamics and the effective cues into the recommendation process. And again, similarly to personality, of course, mood and emotion are also highly sensitive information. So it raises ethical concerns and also, of course, uh, how to research recommender systems or user modeling approaches that are privacy aware. Good, and finally, to end up, I'd like to, well, show you our vision here that is also detailed in this article to which I'd like to point you again, so the Psychology Informed Recommender Systems in the FNTIR paper. And actually, uh, yeah, we believe that further personnel uh, psychology informed recommender systems should really draw from uh, the deep knowledge that has been gained in psychological research in the last, well, decades or maybe well, even centuries in some cases and how to interweave this uh, large corpus of insights and expertise into the more technical perspective that we as computer scientists or uh, AI researchers have. Also how to evaluate recommender systems should be much more focused, we should be much more deeply consider psychological aspects, so to say. Yeah, so basically what we envision is kind of recommender systems that more holistically consider human factors way beyond what is currently done, so way beyond the standard user item rating matrix, so to say, so way beyond the standard explicit or implicit uh, yeah, liking or rating information based on the pure behavioral information of the user. So basically they 
the true research should adopt a very a, a genuinely user-centric perspective if you point it, it out here. Yeah, and this basically concludes our tutorial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So maybe one more thing. So what we did is not discuss in this tutorial because of time. So there is like, of course, a lot of psychological insights when we talk about evaluating recommender systems, because here psychological methods really come into place when it when it's about designing user users experience experiments and so forth but we have a whole chapter dedicated to that in our survey paper so you feel free to check it out or approach us via email or on, on twitter or whatever if you have any questions to that exactly thank you now we did enough shameless self-advertisement <laughs> No, but seriously, of course, we could just give you a very, very brief overview. You'll find much more information. And not only that survey, of course, there also exist a few others. Okay, so thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch break and hope to see you at some point in the future. Yeah, in person, hopefully. Yeah, the in next person, work conference. Now, of course, yeah. <laughs> thank you all for your, for your great questions and um, your interest in, the, in this topic. So, bye. Bye.